É, bom dia a todos. É, Good morning. We will now start our third and last day of the first international symposium in uh, of technology and innovation at the here in Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. Today's panel is today's panel is about uh, Fiocruz initiatives, entrepreneurship program, and Fiocruz Innova. Today we will have. Dr. Rodrigo Correa with us, the Vice President of Research and Biological Collections, Dr. Cristiani Quental from the Entrepreneurship Program of Fiocruz and advisor to Vice Presidency of Production and Innovation in Health, and Dr. Claude Firmez from the Innova Fiocruz Program. Rodrigo, you have the floor. Good morning, Alini. Good morning, everyone. Thank you once again for the invitation. This panel comes at a very uh, good time because Fiocruz is going through a change where we seek more innovation. Um, so good morning to all again. Good morning, Anna, Mariani, and all colleagues. Today, I'm going to present our program, an institutional program within the Innova program at Fiocruz. This program was created to work on the ideas of entrepreneurship within Fiocruz. I'm going to share my presentation now with you uh, related to this program. Right, yeah, so if you can see the screen, so the Innova Labs program at Fiocruz was created based on an important partnership between Fiocruz, Biominas, and the Ministry of Health, it's totally supported both by the Ministry of Health, who has worked with us throughout every stage of this process. It's a good thing that Christiane is here too, because she was also in on this process, Alini as well. And the idea is to seek, uh, well, the idea in the labs sought by the researchers is the idea of innovation. So our program was is based on Fiocruz activities, health, social development to create and disseminate scientific and technological knowledge and be an agent for citizenship, uh, promoting and contributing towards the single health system strategies. So we are connected to the Ministry of Health, as I've said, and we thought it was very important to seek these activities. So we work with production, innovation, and teaching, and uh, health production. Within the field cruise innovation system, on my arrow, you can see there's a whole chain from research all the way to production. But there are some gaps within the process between research and development, and I think here between development and preclinical, there is an area that needs to be better explored. And the idea of Nova Labs is to try and break, is to fill this gap between research and development in order to evolve the Fiocruz innovation system, so to speak. So this program has as a main function to uh, accelerate, pre-accelerate the projects and startups and uh, the partnership with Biominas, the main objective of this partnership is to develop methodology in order to um, accelerate startups, uh, the appearance of startups, and all within our ecosystem. This methodology um, helps this creative process for researchers that are thinking of transforming the ideas into business startups. Um, and count on field crews maybe to support them in terms of production. Uh, 
we know that, as Biomangin said, we cannot um, deal with the whole process. So it's essential to seek other partners outside field crews. We work with digital health and uh, uh, a lot. Animal health is something we still need to develop, especially when we talk about uh, the whole process. This whole process is together. Environment, human health, digital health and animal health. Our program needs to go a bit further, to evolve more, to reach this point. The Innova Labs program uh, is here to solve, uh, deal with these possible ideas and take this all the way to the single health system, SUS. So it's not just researchers that can work on this. It can be any colleague from the institution who can come up with an idea, who comes up with an idea and take, and take this idea and uh, make it help human health. It could be digital health, mental, social health. It doesn't matter what the individual has as an idea. The important, what matters is that this idea impact the health system and impact citizen, which is what matters at the end. To find out and see what's best for um, citizens. We, um, we serve the demands by SUS and try to promote social impact. Our program um, takes 10 weeks, um, co-working at Fiocruz. Many um, colleagues, of course, working in the same environment, but nowadays we have had to adapt to the new conditions. But working virtually has been very good and we have also the uh, technical team of Biominas Brazil working with us, which leads to a big culture and mindset change. We analyze institutional research projects. The methodology is uh, tested and adapted to the new fuel cruise process and adapted to work with what we seek it's practically custom made for field crews. We try to do this. We follow up these quote startups, the selected startups. We uh, involve all the agents, cooperate with companies. And at the end, the business is developed within the process, the whole process in the 10 weeks training. The methodology basically consists of what you see before you. We have the startup culture. There's a startup culture. The whole process is based on inspiration and engaging. The selection starts at the stage when individuals are willing to go th through the program. Then we have the bio business model, the labs w where there is interaction with most companies. At the end, we have the demo day, which is where colleagues who went through this whole process present their ideas. And from there, the ideas are much better structured, more well thought out and engaged within the innovation system after this uh, shaping up as it were for the market in general. And the idea, our idea is that we reach a point when we start, when we get to the startups spin off stage, technology transfer and new innovation. The objective of Field Cruise is that Field Cruise absorb these new technologies and take them to the market. Licensing individuals that took part in the process must. Uh, must enterprise a lot of them want to do this want to become entrepreneurs um create startups what have you so we have this methodology of inspiring engaging accelerating and impacting everyone has access to very rich content always available to participants great dissemination of the program inside and outside field crews through the participation of other important agents in the acceleration process and of 
creation of a new startup mindset and meetings where we um, try to, where we, we're always in touch. Nowadays, unfortunately, this is virtual. Um, it's much richer to be, to meet in person, but we have, things have been improving. We've done our best with the virtual environment. So the Ministry of Health Finances, um, this whole program, nobody is paid for actually what they do. If there is any financial retribution, it would be between the developer and field crews. Nowadays, um, with the new legislation, this may be possible. We have, as I said, a very good te dedicated specialist team. We have mentorship and validation of the process. We have a lot of connection with investors and we, in, we our contact network is Biominas, Ministry of Health and Fuel Cruise, and we're trying to expand it. This whole process is jointly with the Ministry of Health, as I've said, and this partnership um, is in such a way that the ministry can absorb the technology and invest again. It was very interesting when we had the new SVS, where SVS had a specific program they were seeking, and within it, we were able to, to bring some new technologies from within Fiocruz and take them to SBS. This is the, these are the result of the first version, if you will. In, this is, group is from Rio. I'd like to pay tribute to Alini, um, in the picture there, unfortunately, it was taken from us by the pandemic. She was called Alini Novalabs because she Novalabs because um, she dedicated such love to this project. So we'd like to pay a tribute to her and also our respe pay respect to all the families who lost loved ones. So. In the, we see great participation in all our units at the uh, labs, Nova Labs One. For all field crews, our colleagues used to travel a lot to Rio, and this was impacting in terms of uh, how it affair, uh, how it interfered with their life. People from the institution. Um, we saw here a great, um, significant increase of uh, contacts. It's important to show you this because the teams also develop their own logos. So they all have a, we have many onco ID for prostate cancer. Uh, one team dedicated to microbiome. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you see a set of activities that are very wide ranging. The idea, the identity of Innova Labs kind of developed into what will be um, their own startups based on what they started up with. So this is the ranking of the best best uh, presentation of idea or organization, pos market position. Um, my colleague will be able to speak after me. OmniLamp, second place. Their technology, molecular diagnostics, you can, which can be taken anywhere. And Presagi is a group in third place that checks epitopes. For diagnosis. In the second phase, you can see that uh, Celeste, I can't see Chris in this photo here, but Celeste took part in all the meetings and this team started, uh, they took part live and we had to develop the process and take it online. It was very difficult because we had to halt the program and it stayed stationary for a long time. And then 
this activity was resumed. Our, Tasia, our colleague, always very dedicated. Aline as well. Everyone put a lot of work in. Some members of the ministry there. And from there, we started the online process as a whole. At the end, we can see that people participated greatly. We have our colleague here, the director from Field Cruz Bahia. Andre and Sandra, and Andre and Alessandra were partners. She's in the state of Paraná. They took a new idea and created a new possibility to work within the Field Cruise platform system, joining up two ideas. They brought these ideas and created a new system. Yes, a startup, if you will. And this was incorporated to the process of Field Cruise platforms to take two Field Cruise services, join them. By joining them, we can they can create a new idea and bring it into the process. This already clearly shows that distance was not a problem. The problem was to meet up and learn, introduce each idea to the other, if you will, and take it from there. Once again, this is already the second round. We see greater distribution with other institutes. The domination that used to be IOC is not so, so uh, any longer other companies, other groups uh, came in who completed the rounds. In this round, the three top rankings are the third you see there, two from ICC, one from IGM, showing that the ability of other, ability, other units to bring their knowledge to the project also existed. Here we see Mariana with Vittoria, many colleagues, other colleagues, there are many new um, activities. Dimitri here, he worked with his son. Who has worked with us for 15 years, I think. There was great interaction, virtual, in, virtual as well. And the third round of Innova Labs, this was how it was distributed. Great discussion here. We see the IOC and IRR. IRR have the same participation. All units, even though it was distance learning, they worked hard and they achieved results. This is the group of participants. I won't go through one by one, but there's a lot of interesting stuff here. I'll show you one or two of them that are already in partnerships. The third round is two weeks old, or the conclusion is two weeks old. This was how they were, the classification came. The IIR, which is where I'm from, Enechashe Institute, had two uh, occupied the podium, <laughs> first and third, and the IOC second. This is the, this is an examination panel, an examination board, where some people that uh, carry out the excursion with people from the startup, Carlos Anderson, st stayed within the assessment stage. I'd like to call your attention, draw your attention to Sandra. Uh, she was very much impacted by the, the, the growth of the problems that have been happening, but she had a very important participation, obviously. So some team results. Magia from round three is now developed a partnership with Farman Guinness. It's an uh, AI platform for miniature miniature organic synthesis on chips to on microchips to generate um, unprecedented molecules it's a it this type of technology is very interesting 
Diagno Pros from the second round is a partnership, of a PPP partnership, um, an uh, oncological diagnostic that is faster based on spec mass spectrometry. Um, it's important to draw your attention to the award they won. Visinki is still uh, an ongoing partnership. It's a dermal matrix uh, carried out through 3D printing. Omnilamp, part of round one, has internal partnerships, uh, can apply molecular diagnosis anywhere. You can take their machine, for example, their equipment to carry out a COVID test, for example, anywhere very quickly. UV bots from round three, partnership with the INI. It's a mobile autonomous platform for total environment and room and disinfection. Uh, Previni, partnerships with the INI. Um, the Menegeti brush is called Menegeti, Menegeti for collection or uh, self-collection or collection by professionals for diagnosis of STDs. I'd like to draw your attention here to this email. Hello, Rodrigo, it's personal. Um, calling for submissions already for round four. It's important to, uh, you know, it's important to take part, to send in your submissions. This is a program that with, with, the, part, with the participating entities was, is very important. I'm going to show you a quick video, which is very important. Um, and this work I'm going to show you now, they delivered a very beautiful statement during International Biomangim Symposium, where we have an innovation branch. This person is here, and this person said, when this person spoke, it really was from the heart. I'm going to share this with you. Mariana, tell us, right, so we were, as a researcher, you were in the first round of Innova Labs, you trained with the first group, with your students, do you already start off talking immediately about uh, startups? Do you think this changed anything? Did Nova Labs training give you the opportunity to change, not just as a researcher, but at the end there with your students, how was that? Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the this symposium for this initiative, for yesterday's innovation hub. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues here. I haven't seen some of you, my friends from the first round, Arti Pubins, my bosses, William and Rodrigo, miss you all, Chris. I'd like to start off by talking about uh, what was said about how the vice presidency was involved in such innovation. They innovated in the Innova, as the name says, program uh, with the um, with the open openings for bid and the programs themselves. We learn a lot. The management methods, as was put down earlier, it's very important for us. We learned a lot during Innova Labs, the CRL, the JR. We want, we understand what the market is, is aching for, not just what they're interested in, really. This is a radical, change and we will uh, reap the benefits very soon because in about three years time fuel cruise will be another entity so it's an agile form of management we learn during the program and we are definitely already applying this in our day-to-day -day work with our students so the, before talking about this aspect i'd like to say that vice presidency innovation and research they bring 
not just this new initiative for fomenting creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation within Fiocruz, but they also financially support you with the Innova programs and, and the public notices to bid. We, um, we stimulate new talent with the um, offer to bid for new talents to join. So this is a great moment and I'm aware that this will transform field careers and research in Brazil and field careers, of course. And as we said, I think this is all done in a very integrated manner. So this platform network that exists before, this is network formed, a, a solid network together with the financial support. This helps us to create a very rich and fruitful scenario so we can reap good fruits in the future. Thus, we have changed the way we uh, teach and guide our students and how they can see the market's pain and follow up the projects that we carry out within the lab. As Aline said, we currently have moments of innovation pitching. They show their products very precisely, very quickly, very directly, very accurately to convey the message quickly. So this represented absurdly great change. I think students will be much better informed after this point in time. So I'd like to congratulate everyone for this moment. Thank you, Mariana. I think that shows very clearly what our objective is. And finally, I'm going to give you Paulo's testimony. Paulo was the winner of uh, an award. It was widely disseminated. He won this, Paulo Carvalho won this prize recently. And he stated that the, what he thought of our program, it is a watershed, the Nova program is what he said. So the program is, um, is very objective. And the idea is that it uh, improve and develop more and more. And our intention is to just improve more and more. So that's what I had to say. If there are any questions. Thank you, Rodrigo, for your presentation. Yes, Innova Labs is a very innovative program. And as the coordinator of the uh, Center for Technological Innovation here at Fiocruz, I can give you my testimony regarding the change that this program promotes in research mindset. We are all ready to see this reflect, reflex in the offer of these new technologies. So now there's when the NIT, the Center for Technological Innovation, is seeking partners and the researchers need to present and all their technology, we see a great change of those who, we can see clearly who took part in Innova Labs and who didn't in the way they make the presentations, the training for the uh, uh, devising of the pitches. We see already a great distinction between those that took part in the program and those who didn't. We always recommend everyone who can take part do, because it's very important and necessary at this point. And how programs are very much intertwined and integrated to the company, Innova, Innova Labs, and the entrepreneurship program, which will be presented uh, now by Cristiani. And another differentiator of Innova Labs was that it brought together researchers and the uh, Technological Innovation Center. We know that this is something that we need to foment more 
sometimes there is a lot of difficulty in this uh, liaison and the Nova Labs worked this uh, worked on this very well I met Mariana at Innova Labs and this of course um, tightens the relationships and develops everything if you have a for example patent pending if you have a technology that is submitted this makes researchers seek the NIT of their units this is much more interesting for the process as a whole I'd like to uh, take the opportunity here to comment on where, on something you said about the advances towards improvement in animal health. We know this is very important. At the beginning of this year, we signed a joint uh, development agreement with Farmanguinhos to develop for development and exploration of a product and it's uh, an area that has a lot of potential within the institution so let us now move on to Cristiani Quental who is going to who is going to speak now about the entrepreneurship program thank you very much for the invitation and my talk you've been matching with this topic and I'm going to share my slide Okay, well, the program of entrepreneurship stimulus is integrated to Innova Labs, which is basically the beginning of this entrepreneurship program that would come afterwards and effectively to create it to support uh, these companies. And there is a funnel, of course, in this program. Support this company through this entrepreneurship program. Então, o que permitiu, né, a criação desse programa? What has allowed the creation of this program, which was the new legal framework of science and technology, that has opened these possibilities? Our internal conference dated uh, from 2017 um, has decided that we would continue with this. And this idea would bring this institutional policy of Fear Cruz that was an ordinance in 2018. The main objective of this program is to um, to foster entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship attitude of uh, the community of your crews to amplify this keep, the institutional capability to transform knowledge into products and service for healthcare, and we wanted to train uh, in terms of innovation entrepreneurship. Um, for train the um, employees of your crews. Just to illustrate, uh, we have already offered uh, courses of management in ANSP, and the idea is to offer disciplines that we would allow people to have a transverse approach, and then we would have a bigger scope. And we would also would also would like to have a stimulus to support the development of solutions and to incorporate these solutions that would be um, applied in the healthcare system. And in terms of priority, we will, the units of your crews would be benefited from that. And afterwards, we would work. Uh, to create the spin-offs or startups, spin-offs, uh, if it's an internal knowledge of your cruise startups, if this uh, knowledge is coming from outside your cruise, then we would work to support the solutions that are generated to the healthcare system. And then uh, if we get interested in these spin-offs, we can think about licensing these ideas.
Well, our program has two axes. One is to support the maturation of uh, health innovation projects based upon entrepreneurship, aiming at the incorporation to the um, health system. And the second one would be the, this, the dissemination of innovation culture and entrepreneurship. In the first one, the first axis, we have a design process, as you can see on this slide. Uh, it starts from the bottom to the top. And the first block, it would be exactly what we call Innova Labs. Nowadays, you always start above this block, and there is a narrow to, to make you see. Innova Labs accounts for this block. That is the one for training, selection of proposals, interviews, developments of businesses, development of products, and the study of the health um, complex study. And here we have a follow-up of the problem and solution. That's what Nova Labs does. And here in the middle, as you can see in the arrow, as Rodrigo talked about demo day, and demo day, it would be the closing of this phase. But what really starts this new step is what we call cafe with innovation. I mean, coffee with innovation. Uh, it's a board um, formed by a few cruise units in the Ministry of Health and with our first stakeholders. And then if they are interested in this project, in this program, um, to internalize these proposals. Over here, we have the entrepreneurship program. And then we would take these proposals to the market. But that's why we say it's a funnel. If it is internalized um, by the field cruise units, it would go to the green side, as you can see, or it is going to continue in the program and they will receive mentorship and support to, to match the product to the market, development in terms of innovation in technology as well, all this kind of support. And they are going to have access to resources Let's say, for example, we have a pilot project that they wanted to assemble the first um, task kits and, and we give, we provide the support to them. And at the end, what do we have? They have the option, we have the options of licensing this project, but if they're not interested in starting a business or in red, they are going to create a business, to start a business. That's what we call co-entrepreneurship. And they have the support by Fucruz. And the spin-offs and startups and based on technology that will cover all the diversity of Fucruz are those that we are going to support. And we also include social businesses. The second axis, which is the dissemination of culture and innovation, um, culture of innovation, entrepreneurship, then we have actions of training for students, researchers, technicians, and managers. We hold events in order to, um, to promote entrepreneurship and to provide exchange of experiences and network. And we also provide so virtual communication channels. And on top of that, we value the involvement with innovation, both uh, for the employees um, and also for the academia, I mean, for scholars. Well, we want to bring this topic to, to be discussed. That's what we want to do. Where are we right now? Effectively, this program hasn't, it hasn't been published yet. It's still being evaluated by the presidential board, and then it will be evaluated by the Fucruz units. And with regards to the first axis, we have already implemented three pilots. 
we are in, in ex, tr experimenting them and are working on the first edit tool, uh, which is aimed at um, these people that left Nova Labs. Then we're not providing the initial training, but we are trying to retain all this knowledge of the teams and proposals that were worked at Innova Labs, and they want to provide continuity to that. And besides that, we are um, trying to have um, an ampli an ampli uh, you know, trying to amplify the interpretation of the legal framework. Rodrigo has already talked about that, and we understand that this is for all fuel crews employees ranging from, I mean, all, all the positions, um, technicians, you know, managers, uh, students, I mean, not students, but professors and stuff, researchers, and we are, you know, uh, financially supporting that. I mean, we are not supporting that financially in our uh, norms, but of course the researcher that can use part of their working time to dedicate to this business. Um, so the um, academic life allows that that part of this time should be you could be used with the private sector. And our career um, uh, wouldn't uh, won't allow that. Uh, before we can bring that to be incorporated to our career, which is something very similar to the university career, so that we can um, synthesize that. And we are working with the uh, prosecutor's office of your cruise so that we can work upon that uh, legal framework. In the second axis, uh, we are not so active. But we have this discipline of professional master's course with the management of science and technology and innovation. And we have three members, Celeste, and I, and one more, Fragoso, and we are planning many actions for that. Then we have a lot of work to do. Let's now talk about the pilot cases. It's quite interesting to experiment them so that we can validate our proposal. Then, we decided to do that through different technologies with different periods of maturation with different types of teams. Therefore, we have three projects. One is a biosensor for early diagnosis for breast cancers of ICC. It's a, a team that came from Innova Lab. Equipment um, for neurophysiological diagnosis and that's the case of Rodrigo that he show, present, showcased. Um, and another pl digital platform to take care of the dependent elderly. It's from Fercuz in Ceará, the Northeastern region of Brazil. And we're working that in such a way, working that in such a way that we can have a methodology to have um, a, a homogeneous approach. And then with this, we'll be able to treat all these pilots um, homogeneously. We also have um, mentorships every 15 days with each team. In these mentorships, uh, we have the entrepreneurship program, the team, and NEET. And NEET is a critical partnership in this process and it takes place every 15 days. And as the, the team progresses, we take care of the issues that come out. And we also have the training sessions that also happen every 15 days, um, just to try to balance the knowledge of these three groups. Because uh, only one had the Nova Labs, the second one didn't have it. And they uh, reg we registered the second one, the last uh, um, group, because it's a training that it makes a big difference. 
with this, we just had a follow up just to recap things so that people could walk hand in hand together, you know. And they went through this, all these models that you can, modules that you can see on the screen, uh, executive summary, you know, business model, validation proposals, uh, management tools, macro analysis, sales pitch. And right now, we are also providing some internal and external business rounds to them to showcase their projects. Now, in terms of evaluation of the process, what do we have? These teams are very enthusiastic and they are very committed. They meet the technological innovation groups. They are very engaged as well. They are really participating in everything. And the program is really contributing to the uh, acceleration of projects, but we still need a uh, need to harmonize of the institutional understanding about entrepreneurship. It's not homogeneous yet um, in terms of the understanding on this topic. And more, more uh, than that, uh, we need to enhance the organizational flows, uh, workflows. So we need to create new workflows. And this is a, a task that takes more time. And last but not least, I would like to report, say that this process is very slow. It's too slow because I believe that you are going through this pandemic and it's not a priority for all of us but the process of team management is fast but the process of approvals and also the enhancement of the work the work for the organizational workflows um approval is not good it's, it's too slow but we are sure that we are going to approve that soon and we are going to publish this editor this year and we are making the forecast for the budget. And thank you so much for the opportunity. These are our email addresses, Celeste's and mine and Anderson's email addresses who are part of the coordination team. That's it. Thank you, Cristiani. Thank you so much. And also Celeste and and Anderson Fragoso as well for this content. And we are really glad to see the entrepreneurship program is advancing, is progressing the last year, regardless um, of this pandemic. Although we have uh, these barriers that we, uh, that we have to face, but we are really glad to see this progression because as you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, the chaining of these programs is very important. Then we see researchers that participate in, in Nova Labs. And after leaving Nova Labs, they have a mindset change because they want to invest, they want to become entrepreneurs. Consequently, this program is, is critical so that we can uh, supply them with this knowledge. This is quite interesting. Now I will invite another speaker, Dr. Kurt Bermes, who is here with us representing the coordination of this program named Innova Fiocruz, so that she can talk about one more initiative in terms of innovation of Osvaldo Cruz Foundation that is carried out by the Vice Presidency of Innovation and uh, Technology. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry for my delay, but uh, it's an excess of Zoom meetings, Google, and many other virtual meetings. And I got, you know, confused with the time frame. It's a pleasure to be here with you so that we can talk about uh, Innova program. And I'll be sharing my screen right now so that I can quickly um, showcase what I have to say. 
Um, can you see my screen? This program started in 2018, and in three years of work, we have already achieved a very good portfolio with 522 projects that were approved among just, uh, over 4,000 submissions of projects. It shows that we have a very competitive capability and researchers um, that have a great initiative and they are very strong in terms of scientific thinking. Out of these 522 projects, it means that we uh, we can rely on a huge investment with a great involvement of people, the investments of 118 million reais and over um, 4,000 people that are involved in this project. And it started very small uh, with two or three editors, but uh, now, This program grew a lot. So we have a good problem because it grew a lot and we have the difficulty to manage this great amount of projects, but at the same time, it brings us a great richness uh, for all of us so that because we know that what we produce uh, is something good and we know the demand that we have got within our Zola Cruz Foundation uh, in terms of scientific production. The idea behind this program was and is to promote actions that are very articulate to stimulate technological development, innovation, and research in all fields. And it's important to say that it's not only for, for hardware, but also for software, for healthcare, for example, communication. And we are really interested in this production. And we have this commitment of having continuous investment. It should be sustainable within few crews. I mean, um, it started with the initial resources for the Ministry of Health and also the Ministry of Technology, Science and uh, Innovation and the um, few crews uh, foundation fund. This program has the aim to simulate research and development, as I said before, in all fields. Nowadays, we have a, we have a total of 18 calls that are ongoing, that range that come from different fields of the market, and we have a junior post doctorate program that is open. And we have just closed the selection process for these junior postdoc. And these programs are getting started right now. You can see that this amount of calls are organized within axes of operation. Four of them are here. One of them is one that Rodrigo has already covered. I believe he has covered because I wasn't present, which is in other labs. And it, is, it makes a big difference in the execution of projects in the first axis, which is the institutional axis of the exit chain with the results of knowledge uh, generation with new talent to stimulate the youth to participate and to give opportunities uh, to the youth to have their first projects and to leverage the career of these people and with innovative ideas, uh, with clinical research, um, advanced models. And we have many strategic um, demands and I'd like to bring uh, your attention to the projects related to COVID in terms of new management, equipment. Well, each of these editors, uh, the, um, uh, they are included in, within um, a strategic model of this program. Uh, within uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. The structuring that we provide within these axes 
is the following. You would have the beginning of a project with the ideas and the generation of knowledge. And then this would evolve. It's not in our radar to identify uh, how many of these projects would be, I mean, we identify how many of these products could become a products, and then these products would be brought to the market. And many times they would use the structure that we have caught in Fiocruz, in biopharmaceuticals, and they also talk to partners uh, to develop products with startups so that these products can reach the, um, the single health system of Brazil. We have two projects that uh, uh, design these uh, editors because they are within the production chain. And these are the PMA for public policies um, permission to, and also clinical research that are very important for this structure. On top of that, we have many axes of networks and training management that are the base for this program. Oh, particularly, uh, this one about strategy that account for two thirds of the total investments that is put upon this project. And it has a great amount of projects that is very significant. It's a bit less than half of the projects are concentrated in its strategic axis. What is important to us is to think um, the process of these projects that we have had. And we are trying to discuss with the researchers about these projects. The process of execution of the projects is something important, and we have to see what are the inputs, the input, what inputs, what are the inputs of these projects that can be very diverse, and what kind of format um, it will be held. So, what are the inputs, and what what the outputs will be as well because they are very diversified within these context and disciplines that we have got in the projects. And it's expressed in many different formats. And I would like to say that academic production is very significant for any institution, for any research institution. And they are the indicators which are used, the main indicators that are used uh, in the academia, in terms of knowledge, and also in terms of scientific production per se. This is a very critical format, but it's not the single one. It's important to see that there are many other formats, and these other ones are very important as well. And your project can be even bigger than the publication. You can, you maybe you have, you will publish that. You have uh, uh, this line in the lattice uh, curriculum, but it will be even bigger in comparison to what uh, everything that can be done and formats that you can be that you can use in the health system. And the same. It's important that to see that um, to see what is the target audience, to see who the target audience is for your project, for your model, for your software, for your mapping, for your process, no matter what it is, and who is the user, the end user, and they are they can come from everywhere. Therefore, we have been working on this sense uh, on the project as a whole. And we need, to, we know that it's going to generate knowledge, it will bring academic production, and this academic production you express a very important index for any research institution. Well, we have been following these projects and we intend to have an initial, initial meeting after the editors are published and it kind of aggregates people uh, because they can know the projects of each other 
they meet people that were selected. Uh, we cannot do that in person, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, but we are doing that virtually. And the exchange is quite interesting. We follow them up for either six months or 12 months, depend, and it depends on uh, how long the editor will take place. And after that, we promote seminars with preliminary outcomes. And finally, uh, seminars with the final outcomes. And you probably are going to hold the finalization of these first three editors that were uh, started in 2018. One is about product ideas and also knowledge generation. We have a, a, a total of 260 products that are being finalized and the results are very great. It's, it, it touched me to, to talk about that and to see the engagement of our researchers and how much they are producing, be that academically or also to see their concern to bring that to the market, to put that to in the hands of the end user and that should, so that it should bring value to society. Then we are very glad with this result. And that's the team. These are the people that are working on the Nova um, project. And we did that uh, with a great pleasure, but joy. And we can see this richness that has been produced by the institution. And we are really proud of all these things. Thank you. If there are any questions, let me just uh, interrupt here the sharing of screen. Good. Thank you for your presentations. The figures, the numbers for Innova are very important and shows all the effort that Phil Chris has been um, involved in, in terms of what they're doing. And we have the three programs showing us from financing to capacity building and an entrepreneurial mindset. So I think we are treading a path which uh, really looks promising. I would like to, to highlight the fact that uh, Innova was uh, just a great breakthrough from by the program. You have brought the possibility of great projects into the whole management of things, as uh, was said before, when we are involved in all these processes, we need to organize our processes and our inflows. Management needs to change and innovate in order to follow all these changes. I think that is very important. I think Innova, Innova will be a great distinction. We have um, new projects approved within Innova Gestão for technological and scientific innovations and an integrated management system integrated to um, management, which I think will bring great results to the unit. And I'd also like to mention the action by the technological innovation centers. I'd like to mention the importance of the Sistechnit pro a program which is Fio Cruz's system for technological innovation, which is uh, the technological side of things and accompanies all the centers for technological innovation from Fio Cruz. And it has a very in and the roles are very important that they carry out. And specifically with regard to Innova, I'd like to say that the, the participation of the NIT in the informing these projects is very important. Some projects in Innova has many national and sometimes international partners and the NIT, the Center for Technological Innovation, helps to formalize this. We have many agreements formed last year, some are still under negotiation, which is for us to afford more form, uh, formalization to the partnerships established for the development of these projects. 
So it is also, it is representing a great opportunity. This is all very rich for the NIT unit to act in the Innova projects. Right, moving on, I will leave the Q&A until the end as per our schedule. And I will now invite to the table Dr. Mariana Vagabi, who is a researcher from the Functional, Functional Genome and Bioinformatics Lab at IOC. And uh, her team won the first prize in the Innova Labs Field Cruise group, group uh, with the technology uh, entitled Aptima based bi biotechnology for ovarian cancer diagnosis. Right, let me just share my screen here. Right, all set. Can everyone see? Good morning to you all. It's a pleasure for me to be here to take part in this first IOC International Symposium for Research and Innovation. And thank you all very much. It's great, Aline, to be here today to talk about our project, our lab project. The title of my presentation is Aptima based Di Biotechnology for Ovarian Cancer Diagnosis. I am part of the uh, genome uh, studying lab. Now, given the epidemiological data for Brazil in the last few years, we see that our population here is aging. We have a clear change in our demographic pyramid showing that the population is indeed aging and birth rates are going down. So it would be ideal to see everyone like this, aged, elderly, in full health, enjoying their older age. So, and as with, in the case of the aging population, of course, we have been accompanying many diseases, especially cancer. Cancer affects almost 10 million people worldwide and 70% this can affect everyone, right? Including 70% of all deaths from, are from cancer, right? So I'm going to divide this in two topics. First, ovarian cancer, and then I'm going to talk about prostate cancer a bit as well. In the case of ovarian cancer, we know that the cancer um, diagnosis is usually late. In the case of ovarian cancer, it's even later. 70% of diagnostics take place late, which leads to the result of three in four deaths for women diagnosed with ovarian cancer over five years. So we're talking about a world population of 1 billion women who can develop ovarian cancer in the age group from 20 to 65. In Brazil, 60, 67 million women. Any type, any woman can develop this kind of cancer in the ovarian region. And it's considered the gynecological tumor that is hardest to diagnose. Nowadays, uh, diagnostics are carried out through a serum marker, CA125, which is very unspecific, which can show sometimes other neoplasias and other pathological conditions can be uh, can accompany it not cancer it can be associated to ultrasound images which are very inconclusive due to the ovarian anatomy and to conclude the ovarian cancer diagnosis you need to carry out exploratory surgery which can take up to 20 hours in other words very costly and damaging to patients so we have been uh, using uh, an aptima-based aptima solution. They are synthetic nucleotides. It's a small sequence of synthetic nucleotides, RNA or DNA, in the central core, 20 to 80 nucleotides uh, in these known regions using, using 
the sequencing technique. So the primary sequence of these aptamas characterizes this three-dimensional structure and they are capable of, with great affinity and specificity, to identify molecular targets that can be cell receptors or intercytoplasmatic proteins. So on the first goal, on the first topic, our goals are to select specific aptamas to differentiate metastatic and non-metastatic ovarian tumor cells. Second, to predict selected aptamas 3D structures through an in silico approach to test the anti-tumor effects of the selected aptamas and validate them with regard to specificity in the tissues of patients with ovarian cancer confirmed. So we counted there here on the support of two Fiocruz programs, Innova Fiocruz through the public notice for innovative ideas and the Innova Labs program with lab for You and Onco-ID, where I took part in a team coordinated by Dr. Anna Carolina Guimarães. So let's talk a bit about the ovarian tumor. We know that this tumor can affect many cells, uh, as you can see here, stromal, epithelials, germ cells. The epithelial cells are the ones that are most affected. 95% happen there and they can be broken down into serous, endometrioid, clear cells, and mucinous. The serous type is the one that is, affects more, as I've said before. So we use this kind of cell in order to develop our project using two cell type, um, CATOB3, primary site, uh, identifying the cells with smaller potential, met metastatical potential. And the other type with a bigger potential. We use the cell selects to select the specific aptamas. We use the tumoral cells with metastatic potential and the non-metastatic potential in order to obtain specific aptamas for this cell type. For, so there is no recognition of non-tumoral cells. So we carried out a specificity analysis where we demonstrate that these selected aptamas are highly specific for ovarian uh, tumor cells, not recognizing the non-tumoral cells. And we used uh, flow cytometry analysis. This is a 3D model. In order to test the effect of these aptamas, we're still talking about uh, a pool of selected aptamas. On the first line, we see non-tumoral cells, where we see on the 3D model, the expression of phalloidine, which marks the subskeleton. And in red, we see the mitotracker, uh, which shows the mitochondria. In the tumoral cells, we can see that we have a loss of tubulin expression. Now, still trying to understand the targets identified by these aptamas, we use an in silico analysis in order to try to understand these biomarkers of the cells recognized by the aptamas. For that, we have a long uh, stretch, a long journey. We started this analysis at the beginning of the pandemic where we tried to characterize the 2D and 3 the structure of the aptamas. So we characterize these structures using many computer algorithms of the five main aptamas that we selected in our methodology. So later on, we were able to uh, carry out anchorage with the potential proteins which are super expressed in the tumoral cells in detriment of the non-tumoral ones. Thus, we are able to advance in diagnosis with greater specificity so that we are able to apply this diagnosis for densitometry and CT scan to, to have better, to be more conclusive in order to avoid greater uh, periods of surgery and be more successful because patients would only be forwarded for surgery in case the liquid biopsies were positive in the case of blood analysis and the imaging of the uh, tumor location in the case of 
positivity. So now our second topic for prostate tumors, we know that one in three men eventually develop prostate tumors. It's a very high, um, it's a very incident. Three in 10 men die from the disease to, to today still. So it's due to late diagnosis as well. And the therapies, very damaging therapies in the case of adverse reactions that are still found. Cancer treatment is nowadays still very much based on surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and more recently, immunotherapy. But with uh, great, very scarcely because of the high costs applied to this kind of therapy. So we intend to carry out a non-invasive method that is specific avoiding the serious side effects observed both in chemo and radiotherapy. The aptima-based cancer therapy is, therapy is very versatile. Aptimas have many kinds of applications. They can be used in therapy as a direct target. They can be used as addresses or carriers. So basic, we base ourselves on this methodology for to use specific aptimas for tumoral um, prostate cells in comparing them to the non-tumoral ones. So the objective is to select specific aptimas to prostate tumor cells where the non-tumoral cells are not identified to test the specificity of tumor cells, especially the metastatic ones, at least in the first instance, which is up project is based on and to test the anti-tumor effect of these selected aptimas. Finally, we intend to also validate these selected aptimas in samples of tumor cancer or with with the uh, tumors already confirmed. So then we have the cell selects selection of cells. So we select the aptimas for the metastatic tumor cells for the with the metastatic potential and avoid the connection to non-tumor cells. So the first approach here is vis-a-vis -vis specificity. We see at the top the aptimas in green at many points in time, 30, 60, 120, 240, and 30, 360 minutes incubation with the aptimas. And we show a recognition of the aptimas by the LNK um, types of tumor and 30, 360 minutes, this mark, these marks are lost due to aptima endocytosis. At the lower panel, on the lower panel, we show the flow uh, symptometry. We show the specificity. In pink, we see the marked cells in detriment of the non-recognition and non-marking of the RWPE non-tumor cells. So we show, we show that the aptimas are very specific for tumor prostate cells. We've not advanced that much with uh, the aptimas. In order to prove the anti-tumor activity with the aptimas, we show four aptima concentrations, 0.25 micromolar, 2.5, 25, and 50, where we clearly show the loss, loss of feasibility of the cells, and they're rounding up and to 50,000, the cells loosen themselves from the plates, which shows for all effects that they're dying. We show, show the Presto Blue um, process below, where we observe specificity only for the LNK tumor cells in the different concentrations, with no effect over the RWP tumor cells. We advance a bit with regard to the profile of how this anti-tumor activity happens. And we see the induction of death cells through apoptosis. We also have a kinetic study here of 20 to 70 minutes, where we mark the cells with calcium blue, showing the viable cells at the beginning of the process. The, mark, the marking with annexin 5, which shows the membrane of the cells here covered in the red substance used in the test. And the caspase, caspase 3 process, which shows active apoptosis. In this image, we show 
viable cells. And after interaction with the aptomers, we see an increase of the caspase 3 activity profile. So we show through this essay that the aptomers induce cell deaths through the programmed um, cell death by ap through apoptosis. Later on, we want to study each selected aptoma. So we selected the five most frequent aptomas and carry out an aptofluorescence um, individual study with the aptomas. In the RWPS, in the non-tumoral cells, we carried out the study. We see no markers on the five aptomas used in our study. <coughs> we observe the marker on all LN capped cells and we advanced a little towards cells with metastatic potential, U145 and PC3, but with different characteristics. While LN cap show metastatic in lymph nodes, the 145 shows metastatic in the cerebral metastasis and PC3 bone metastasis. And it's very interesting to observe that many of our aptomas recognize not only the LN cap cells, but the PC3 and uh, DU145 cells. This way, through these five aptomas, we would have an aptoma panel that would be able to recognize many types of meta uh, cells with metastatic potential. So thus, we hope we can contribute towards the male quality of life, standard of living, and contribute in order for them not to be affected by more um, by earlier diagnosis. We worked uh, with a big, with a large group coordinated by myself, Dr. Alini, Dr. Wim de Grave. We counted on the participation of studies, Ayana Breu, who is a PhD student who works with the aptomas and ovarian cells, Natasia Araujo, who worked with us on uh, apta for you, Tayani Sasaru, who is a master's degree student and develops projects based on prostate cancer, and Carolina Guimarães, who is our, who is our collaborator in all analyses that help greatly helps us in this approach. I have to thank. I, I have to also thank the meet of IMC and. Uh, who has helped us with our patent process. And uh, it, our, this process has been approved and we are in the final phase. And I'd like to thank Nova Labs and also Innovative Ideas Program for all the investment in us and on, in this team. Thank you so much. Mariana, thank you so much for your presentation. It's a great opportunity for the aptometers technology and how it can be determining in, in cancer diagnosis, in ovary and prostate cancer diagnosis. We are really proud of this project. It's a great sign of our brilliant partnership and we are in a final phase. And we really, expect uh, uh, to have the proper partners so that we can make this product accessible to the whole population. That's our, our great objective. Now I would like to bring to this panel Dr. Paolo Alvin, who is the entrepreneurship of secretary of the innovation um, in Science Technology Ministry to be talking about the initiatives uh, that are aimed at stimulating innovation in light of the new legal framework for science, technology, and innovation. Dr. Paolo, you have the floor. Good morning, Aline. First of all, we are really enthusiastic when we see a presentation like this one that Marina has just presented basic research and turning into a product that can contribute to quality of life of people. 
with this, we get really happy with this, this example, among many others that you have got at Field Cruise. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I would like to say some points here. First of all, the experience that we have had with the Cruise Neat and IT is fantastic because we develop a fantastic work. And you have embraced the opportunities that are generated by the legal framework for science, technology, and innovation. That's the first thing that I would like to mention here. Because you at Field Crews could incorporate that feeling. The second point I would like to bring is the following. We have a great challenge to put the legal framework into practice because Many of the initiatives and instruments and tools that are available um, I would say that which is I would like to highlight the technological demands in this pandemic scene and this healthcare situation that we have got now. So this is critical for you to advance in terms of the problems that are arising. On top of that, I would like to say that we have this challenge. The second critical point refers to the um, legal security, which is something that we have to still advance. But I would like to state and mention a work that has been developed by prosecutors and the public minister, ministry members to bring uh, legal tools that bring security to the public manager, to the NITs, so that they can use the legal framework in terms of innovation, science, and technology. And last but not least, we have a challenge as well um, that through the uh, incentive instruments, we have the following challenge, which is to ensure a continuous flow for resources to be invested in science and innovation. At the end of last year, we had the support of the National Congress, a great mo um, mobilization of the private market as well. And we had the approval of the non-contingency of FGCT. That was a, a dream that did it for long. And now we have this approved and sanctioned law, but now in 2021, we still have the challenge of budgeting this resource. We have to, to have the budget for this critical fund, uh, which is very strategic in our Brazilian reality in the federal government so that we can ensure resource, private resources that come from 15 different sectoral funds that are aimed at investments to, um, to, to make it true, make it come true. Last year, when we had uh, funds from FMNCT, we could invest over 150 million in the solutions for COVID-19, both in the academia as well as in companies. And we were really successful with this. And today we are already collecting the first fruits, the first outcomes of this investment that was made last year. With the building of construction of solutions that we that help us to 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 fight this pandemic. And a few cruises, one of the benefited ones. Uh, in this journey with many projects in research that has been funded. And we have also invested in some laboratorial projects. And it's good to see that we have this continuous work. And lastly, we have, we published a work with a great concentration uh, of the federal government last year in October. And October is considered the innovation um, month uh, in our nation. And we have the we had a decree that uh, 
made the innovation national policy public and we could create the chamber of innovation governance this chamber has a, a critical role and we have the participation of 11 ministries to build uh, guidelines in terms of legislation regulations to build uh, mechanisms and tools but more than that it's a convergence effort to support innovation and we are all the time listening to uh, the academia and the private sector we have already had the second meeting in may last may and in that opportunity we could approve uh, innovation strategies for the period between 2021 and 2024 that are focused on human capital uh, science and technology innovation infrastructure um, fostering these initiatives access to market innovation culture and also intellectual property with that we built a political tool and strategic tool to implement these mechanisms that are going to contribute in a meaningful way uh, to the operationalization of the legal framework. Besides, we have been facilitating uh, mechanisms for the incentives of innovation and research and technology and in our ministry, in our department, we manage four axes that are induces of innovation process. First, which is historical, that this year commemorates its 30th anniversary, which is the um, IT law that was reformed at the end of 2019. We have also Lei do Bem, law which is previous to the legal framework and it's fruit of a long process to agglutinate stimulus stimuli to support companies we also have PADIS, which is a program focused on semiconductors conducers and it's a strategic uh, tool that gives uh, technological sovereignty to our work and Route 2030, which is a specific program based on Lei Du Bain Act that is focused on mobility. Within this concept, we can state that we have a mix of legal and regulatory frameworks that has that have evolved throughout time, and it, it can be enhanced and right now we are negotiating with the National Congress and the Ministry of Economy to make some adjustments in the Lei Duben Act, um, which is an instrument that would benefit over um, 2,300 companies throughout uh, all over the country. And we have been making big efforts for uh, having advances in the Global Innovation Index because we are making this group of adjustments. On top of that, we have um, uh, investments that are coming from companies and we are improving the relationship uh, with companies in the automobile industry. And now I would like to announce a strategy, a rescue um, strategy, because in the past uh, we were working on the initiative that we had for human resources in strategic fields, the allocation of doctors and masters in companies. And through the CNPQ Research Center, uh, we were we started this initiative with startups and incubate, incubators. And this week we are going to start that. And I can say that we are benefiting this first call around 65 businesses, companies. And fruit of this high um, program, we are building with the CNPQ Research Center a proposition for a high and a more amplified approach 
And we also have a very important point that I would like to highlight here, which is something that's been due to FINEP, which is a great call to what we say, which we call uh, innovation spaces that range from lab, you know, labs, technological parks, innovation centers, and also uh, the smart cities. That's the intention that we have got to, for, with the ministry and FINEP, and these year are going to launch this instrument that's going to give additional support to strengthening the innovation ecosystems. On top of the uh, continuous uh, effort that we have got uh, to leverage in you know private resources investment so we have endowment and other instruments that are not frequently used nationwide and we have been working hard to bring more investments for this uh, private sector to mitigate their risks in innovation and in addition to technological risk we have to mitigate um, market risks and financial risks. Another point that I would like to bring and highlight over here is this interaction that more and more is stronger with the entrepreneurial sector and academia, and it can be measured by the expansions of the instruments and the strengthening of different types of ecosystems nationwide. This is something which is something that uh, is very enthusiastic. And I've been working on science and technology for over four decades, and I'm, I am a, very enthusiastic about that. And we have been able to evolve, although we face difficulties, although we still have a small amount of resources and the country needs to invest more and more in science and technology, and we have to def find something else. And we have been working that here internally. We have to invest in sectors that can impact the technological sovereignty. And health, which is a field where you really operate very well with excellence, it becomes more and more strategic, especially in this field of pandemic, this pandemic. Then we have to be prepared for the following steps and following needs. To wrap up, I would like to say that we are making big efforts uh, internally that would involve our St. PQ Research Center Agency and FINAP and also EMBRA-P. And from the technological scientific knowledge, they need to be very supported with more students, researchers, and support to uh, infrastructure and research. And then we have the challenge. And when we see the report of Dr. Mariana in the sense of uh, going through the patent process, we need to transform the technological scientific knowledge into product because it's excellent, especially in healthcare, it must be turning to richness. I mean, this knowledge should generate new uh, good um, positions of jobs, is to sell so that it can generate a virtuous cycle to society and to impact the improvement of quality of life of our population. So very briefly, these are the words I'd like to, to bring to you. Uh, MCTI ministry, I mean, the Technology and Innovation Ministry is available uh, to support field crews and really bet in science, in the Brazilian science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Paulo. I believe your talk was very inspiring and it brings great joy um, to see these numerous actions that the ministry has been providing and promoting and the future actions that are about to take place. And here we are we're talking about all the projects in this field, which is innovation, intellectual property, and Fiocruz has been promoting that. I believe that this focus on the intellectual capital and innovation culture and intellectual property per se and infrastructure 
is really needed so that we can advance. When you mentioned to actually to practice these science, technology and innovation landmark, because we always try to talk about this the whole time, it's not enough for there to be the landmark and the law be enacted. We have to use it. <laughs> we need to study that and work on that within our unit institution and use the possibilities the, the science, technology and innovation landmark has enabled us to. That is what we have been doing in spite of all the difficulties that we know the CTI uh, institutes have been going through. And another point you mentioned about legal security, which is extremely necessary. And I'd like to take the opportunity now to congratulate the uh, prosecutors who have worked in the permanent chamber, uh, Adeline Costa, who is the um, attorney for Fiocruz. And these um, instrument models, the um, opinions of the chamber, these are all very useful within the chambers. This has been happening at Fiocruz. So we have greatly used these opinions and conclusions and use these instruments in order to practice the landmark of science, technology and innovation. And now to conclude our panel, I'd like to invite Ana Luisa Marcado, who is the ex head for acceleration of Biotech Town. She's going to tell us about the experience of Biotech Town. I've already had the opportunity to see it. And I think it will be good for everyone here to find out a bit more about Biotech Town. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to greatly thank you all in, on behalf of Biotech Town to talk about this information hub to such a distinguished group that is so important in the innovation scenario in Brazil. I'll just share my screen with you. Please tell me when um, it, it's all set. Just one second. Bom, agora eu acho que foi certo. Agora sim. Right. Okay. Bom, então, é um prazer estar aqui para falar. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about Biotech Town. I think this is perfect medium for this, uh, to talk about this. We joke when we talk about Lab to Life, our commitment is to make good products reach society. So the papers, we want the papers to become invoices. We have this in-joke amongst us. My name is Ana Marcado. I'm the head of acceleration from Biotech Town, Biotech Town. I'm a master's degree in technology. I worked in for 12 years in, in the industry for in vitro diagnosis, where I moved from basic research, R&D within the industrial sector. And from there, I moved on to the market. And since August last year, I have been privileged to form part of the Biotech Town team. So who are we? We are an innovation hub in the state of Minas Gerais, specifically in the town of Nova Lima. And it's a hub geared exclusively towards the development of companies, products, and business in the areas of biotechnology and life sciences. That is a picture of our space. If you don't know it yet, we invite you to, to visit us. 
there are obviously safety rules and protocols, but soon everything will come back to normal. Before talking about the business development program of which I'm the head, I need to contextualize a bit why Minas Gerais, and I'm going to tell you about the biotechnology scenario in our state. Minas Gerais is the second main state in concentration of biotech companies, over 600 companies, equivalent to 12% of the total of the segment in the country. And Minas Gerais has over 20 science and technology institutes installed there. We are very close to universities and other research centers, as well as unconnected, un unbound research centers from universities. These ICTs, or, or these tech, uh, innovation technology centers, 60% of them were founded as from the year 2000, um, became, started becoming more uh, accessible. And it's interesting to see that only one third of the ICTs in the state focused on biotechnology have some kind of accreditation, and only 20% have visa related accreditations. They have infrastructure, adequate equipment for the practice of RDNI, but with great institutional and structural uh, problems. In the state of Minas Gerais and other states, there is a great institutional, legal, structural difficulty to install this type of development to the product production sector. <laughs> When we take the innovation uh, process as a whole, we are able to identify some very important risks in structuring all this process. So if I could break them down, I would choose four major macro processes, ranging from basic research, product development, registration of these products until the time comes to launch these new products into the market. Each phase has its own uh, feature. When we talk about basic research, we're talking about the initial stages, discovery of new um, drugs, molecules, applications, product development. We're talking about the actual formulation, the efficacy proof, proof, proof test, uh, precision tests, which uh, characterize the product. And a very important phase is the transfer of all this knowledge, this theoretical product to the industrial processes in order for this to be pro produced en masse in large scale. <laughs> the registration phase for the product is very important, the final validation tests. And finally, in the process, we launch the product, commercialize it, train sales teams, seek partners in the ecosystem that can absorb these products and a very important point which is post sales so this is the whole innovation process broadly speaking uh, characterized by these four macro stages now within these stages we identify important gaps with regard to basic research the problem is we have a low investment small investment by companies we see that there is greater we seek more and more basic research it's an expensive process and uh, takes longer in terms of the projects not every company has its structure ready to invest in uh, r d and this phase is characterized by great technological risk there is a high risk of failure for that for those initiatives due to the inherent demands of the process as a whole. In terms of product development, we have many gaps. I highlight three: <laughs> infrastructure. It's very uh, uh, costly. It's a, a barrier vis-à-vis -vis access to the technology for the technology to the market. It's analytical services of clinical tests. They need a lot of investment. Clinical trials, sometimes we are not even, the companies are not able to, to carry out these, uh, and these trials. 
the process has been changing, but this is still a barrier and a lab structure, especially manufacturing point of view, without the accreditations, they are very necessary for production of that product to take place. The registration phase, frequently companies, the people who develop the products have a low level of knowledge of a product registration phase, what it entails. This translates into having to redo many, uh, a lot of work. Sometimes an entrepreneur takes the development of their product to very advanced stages, but the regulatory aspects demand that some tests be presented due to lack of knowledge of the process. The researcher is not aware of that, so we have to go to back step. And it can take a long time, this process, and it be, can be quite bureaucratic. <laughs> when it comes to product launch, there are structural costs for production and uh, commercialization of the product. And then there is restriction, there are restrictions and uh, lagging. So when we take technology growing more and grow on one side, on the other hand, we have society who is um, begging for these products, these technological products. There is a great market need and we take this process this innovation process and identify these gaps. That is the context that Biotech Town's proposal is in. So that's how Biotech Town structure was created. So our goal as an innovation hub is to accelerate the development of solutions and business in biotechnology and life sciences in order to impact people and improve their lives as that of society as a whole. Talking about our areas of interest, which are many, from human health, bioenergy, agriculture, environment, but we are currently greatly concentrated on initiatives geared towards animal and human health, medical devices and digital health. Uh, little by little, we notice there is great migration into food, agriculture, environment, but the four first areas here side by side are the predominant ones in terms of our interactions. So what do we offer as a, an innovation hub? Our proposal is to connect the ecosystem as a whole, impact on the ecosystem as a whole. So. Our initiatives bring a start from startups all the way up to multinationals, large companies. So what do we offer for each player? Networks, partnerships, R&D labs, and our <coughs> production plant, manufacturing plant. I will show you our business units a bit later so you will better understand how we operate in the offer of these services. Regulatory assistance, we have uh, a lot of consultants, partners within this realm who are um, ready and trained and accredited for this to help with legal assistance. <coughs> Market intelligence in terms of resource attraction from academic spin-offs, turning them into businesses, startups, and connect all these good ideas, these initiatives with these many players, market players, small companies, investment funds, large companies, multinationals, uh, research and innovation centers. I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about how we work with these players here. We have a few uh, biotech town business units. There are three of them, business developer, open lab and CMO. I'll talk to you a bit about each one of them, starting off with business developers. The business developers uh, comprises our current programs where we are concentrating our activities. There are two of them. Business development program, it's very much geared towards startups, investment funds, research centers, and our customized partnerships which are based on the concept of open innovation, very much geared towards multinationals and large companies, companies that wish to increase their 
um, project range. I'm going to talk about them very briefly. The business development program was born together with Biotech Town. In 2018, when Biotech Town was born, we launched the first call for business to business development. And this program seeks to accelerate uh, biotech businesses. So it's totally customized with its own technology. We concentrate our efforts on developing business geared towards biotech. So through our business development program, the startups will have access to direct investment <coughs> by these centers. We have a, a pool of investors. Every year we invest directly 150,000 reais into maximum of 10 companies. Our, this, we also contemplate other benef benefits. The lab structure, I'll talk about this later. And we have consultancies, mentorships. Uh, in hours, equivalent to 150,000 reais. We have a business development team that works hands-on with these entrepreneurs. And we have three pillars within this business development uh, program. The first pillar is value drivers, where we identify the important drivers for, in terms of intelligent development for companies and business goals. The second important pillar is infrastructure. In other words, when startups are selected for this program, as well as receiving investments, financial investments, and have the an established business development program. There is also structure given to them, co-working, meeting rooms, open lab, and CMO, as well as having access to the whole network of relationship of biotech lab. And the third pillar is this benefit based on strategic networking. It's a development hub where we um, we pledge to speak to these entrepreneurs in order to afford them connection to research centers, major companies to absorb their businesses, investment funds, and other ecosystem players. Our program, it has its own methodology. We have the annual 12 month month program. So the, in this acceleration program, we follow the startup for 12 months. They start off by registering the program, as well as being a spontaneous registration. We open up the call, um, the offer, and the companies can apply. We also work a lot in active prospection. We have our team of startup hunters who seek as well as in research centers, universities, and other accelerators and incubators, we seek the startups that match whose value proposal fits that of the one at Biotech Town. Based on this registration, we have a selection process where we analyze the startup as a whole, mainly if there is um, adherence of the value proposal to the acceleration program if this alignment takes uh, exists and then we have an evaluation board with two focuses one for the market so the market professionals we invite to analyze the value proposal from a market point of view and the technological board where we call another professional profile a profile of professionals from our group to look at those startups and view them from a technological point of view. So then we go we go on to the bio sprint phase, as we call it. Around twenty, we take twenty startups to this phase, more or less, where we will accompany for a month very closely all these startups, and then we carry out due diligence of the business for the, these startups value proposal, deeper analysis vis-a-vis -vis technology, intellectual property, market um, funding. So 
we then we start the acceleration process. Although these startups have not yet been selected for the program, there are a lot of consultancy and men mentorship programs. And importantly, during this phase is where we develop through a perfect diagnosis, we develop a business plan that these startups will develop in the months following the acceleration project. So at the end of the biosprint phase, we have a final selection board where our investors evaluate not just the startups in terms of value, but the action plan that has been built during that month with the biotech town team. Once these, uh, once they are selected, they join our acceleration program. They receive our investment and they then join de facto our bio run program for another uh, 11 months. Within each month of acceleration, we used to have one um, in-person week. We call it an intensive week where people attend in mentorships in person, uh, lectures and uh, development of the entrepreneurial uh, mindset of these uh, or, or bias of these entrepreneurs. And then they interact with some market players. As I said to you, we are a very hands-on team, so these uh, startups are followed for a month. Although they have very well-defined methodology, the startups have stages, different stages and needs. So this custom is tailor-made and adapted based on the startup's needs. So after these 11 months are over, we have a demo day <coughs> where we have all these businesses that have been accelerated um, analyzed by the market players then these startups are followed for a further five years within a bio fellow program as we call it where we will follow them not in so hands-on but we try to follow them very closely for another five years so this is our current portfolio. We have 22 comp biotech companies, digital health, AI, oncology. Uh, these companies' valuation is around 80 million reais. And these companies are dispersed around. We don't select only in the state of Minas Gerais one of the positive things that this pandemic brought if you can say that was the possibility to analyze everything online and therefore we <coughs> extended our borders in the last edition of the program we had companies from other states not just Minas Gerais Sao Paulo also from southern states taking part and we are moving on to the fourth edition of the program in the next few days we will be uh, changing and starting the call for companies to take part in the program. The other initiative of our business development are the uh, tailor-made partnerships. There are three pillars, business development, uh, the, the largest one that permeates the initiative is business development, as I've said. We also build initiatives geared towards innovation culture in these major companies and image promotion of these companies associated to innovation. So these companies that accompany research and development to identify innovation, they need players outside the structure and they hire biotech town for this academic spin-offs, uh, startups, or research projects. So it's very interesting work. Well, we have another opportunity to our business, which is Open Lab, which was inaugurated at the end of last year. And unfortunately, we couldn't have a big, brilliant inauguration ceremony. But I bring here 
a bit of these two structures, Open Lab was created to serve these critical demands that are related to infrastructure in the lab for biotechnological and science of life companies. Then what is important to mention here, uh, um, that Open Lab allows the startup to have access to this hub, to this lab, which is a top range, top notch um, lab. And it also avoids the immobilization of investment, which is critical for the startups because they have their highest risk, which is technological risk. It's an area that totals almost 400 square meters uh, that has got necessary equipment for using um, this premise. And the equipment are, the pieces of equipment are distributed among different laboratories, technological innovation lab and microbiology, molecular biology, cell uh, uh, harvesting. And here are real images of this space. But if you um, log on the website of, of Open Lab, uh, we have a virtual tool in the website to have an idea of how this structure is organized. So I invite you all to, to, to know about this structure. We have another unit, which is the third one, which is the manufacturing site that we have got. Then, this is a contract manufacturing organization, a CMO. We set a structure that provides all the needed infrastructure for the production of products, products that would need to, um, needed to be certified. Then this structure is awarded and certified by the Brazilian Sanitation Agency, Anvisa, and uh, it is standardized to, to, to develop a commercial batches. And this product aims at startups, small businesses, and big business that need to outsource their productions. CMO, besides following all the Anvisa uh, standards um, in terms of processes and sanitation, it also follows the strict um, standards of um, uh, confidentiality. The area is big, over 409 square meters of the certified area that is distributed in all. This is quite interesting because here we can see all the productive chain, and then you see the productive uh, production, waiting, uh, I mean, weighing uh, area, um, packaging, labeling area, among all of them that you can see here on this slide. And they can choose to to use the CMO of the attack tell, a manpower, or they can bring, the companies can bring their own manpower and use only the area to produce their products. This is a real image again of our space, some machinery that is used for a quick testing. And today we have a license to perform class one and class two testing. And uh, to the end of this um, half of the year, we want to amplify this scope. On top of all these programs, we have institutional partnerships with important uh, groups. And it's important to mention the partnership we have got with Fiocruz. And I really hope that we can include Fiocruz here as one of the greatest um, institutional partners. We have partnerships over here, as you can see in the slide, in the innovation ecosystem. For example, Mitopet Institute, to, um, Gafano, IPT, some universities. And also, we have. Um, um, commercial partnerships with investment funds, banks. And this year we have um, started our partnership with City Bacinas and other innovation um, companies. These are some residing companies because it's an innovation hub. So these are the companies that we have got in our portfolio. 
we have a physical space that is dedicated to these companies, uh, Biotech, Herba, Hermes, and this other one. And now I'd like to invite you all to follow our work in the Innovation Forum, uh, both for LinkedIn, Instagram, or uh, Facebook. So with this, I wrap up, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I invite you all to know our, to visit our structure. Um, Aline uh, could visit our structure before the launch of the labs and the Nova Hubs. Okay, so thank you so much. You're all invited to visit our space. Thank you, Anna, for your presentation. Yes, I went to Biotech Tower in 2018, I believe. You know, it's been some time. It's time to get back, right? I believe many things have changed. Yes, many things have changed from its launch to today. Uh, this space is amazing, Nova Lima. It's a beautiful place, a very pleasant place. When I visit there, I could observe that, and for sure, you get back soon, especially now with this special invitation uh, to have a partnership with your crews. And I believe that's going to be amazing so that we can work in partnership with the Tech Town. Biotech Town, and for sure, let's keep in touch so that we can make it viable. I mean, some startups and projects that we can work with the IOC. When I saw the presentation of the dear colleagues talking about another program, uh, we were, I was figuring out on how we could um, establish this partnership. And I view this partnership very positively and I'm really open to do it, to make it come true. All right? For sure. I think your talk was quite interesting, especially that slide where you present the uh, bottlenecks uh, in terms of research until you can um, have a final product. And everything that you have mentioned is exactly what you're going through, experiencing, which is the wide investment that the company that I don't want to take this risk and have been through that in some negotiations with the companies in terms of partnerships. And when you bring the needs of an initial investment, they kind of take a step back because they don't want to run this risk. And this is why it's very important to we as public as a state owned institution to have this approach to foment this basic research. There is not a part of your talk that mentions the regulatory issue. We have this bottleneck, uh, you know, and we are in this discussion trying to work it out and trying to bring more knowledge, not only to researchers, but also to the innovation field of the innovation department of our institute about regulatory aspects that come from different products that can be developed in a few crews, ranging from diagnosis, vaccines, biopharmacal, biopharmaceuticals, and biochemicals are different. You need to know more about this knowledge. This is very important. And the process per se, that in fact, here in Brazil, it takes a long time. It's very bureaucratic. There's a lot of red tape and it kind of impairs our process of development, especially when we think about a partnership with a company that has a different timetable until you bring this product to the market. Then um, we should be a faster and not enough to miss these opportunities. Now I'm going to bring the questions. Let's go. Well, First, um, there are many people that are very thankful uh, for Innova Labs. And Andre, that's congratulating on uh, Rodrigo and Innova Labs program that is a watershed for him without even within few crews. We also have another question from Fred Luciano Santos, who asks to Rodrigo, 
Rodrigo, thank you so much for explanation. I participated in the second group of the Netherlands, and I'd like to know if there is a planning uh, for the follow-up of these teams after finalizing the program. Well, thank you for a question. In this process, uh, we are now organization this follow-up with Cristiani that has shown part of what is going to be done. And she can add something here. The idea is to give continuity with the funding and also with the office. And Cristiani can talk more about that for the office for follow-up. That's the way. And the idea of Innova Lab is to have what we we developed and now try to have this follow up with Cristiani and the her team. I believe Anna and IT will have a very important role in this process, as Cristiani has mentioned. Uh, the axis of entrepreneurship. We have the first phase of the internal offer, the internalization of the technology. And afterwards, we have the licensing phase. And afterwards, we are going to have entrepreneurship through a startup or a spin-off. Then this technique system will have a critical role in this post-Innova Labs and post-Innova program phase. Because as we have already mentioned, we have a three Innova program editors that are going to be over in the second half of the year. And I believe that this process is going to be crucial so that we can have a North Star so that we know where these parts will go in, are going to. It's perfect. I'd like to add something, not only to give a North Star, but but also to help us to operationalize that. Because now we're dealing with business deals, partnerships, it's exact moment that we need to have the greatest participation of the INT because entrepreneurship program, we think that the team is a program and the team itself and the NIT, and we make it a single group. For sure, Chris, we are so engaged in such thing. And we have a, a, a partnership with EVPs and you and Celeste. I have worked with Celeste for so long at GSTAC. When we are here together, together efforts with the entrepreneurship program as we're doing with Innova Labs and also Innova Field Cruise program. I'm going to continue now with more questions. Well, we have one more question of Floriano Silva Jono, who is asking about the following. The FAPEG editor that is open requires us to be located in Rio Janeiro City, and it should also uh, meet the requirements of ETI. And so should we uh, get adequate? Should we meet these requirements? Oh, I didn't read the editor of a page, to be very honest with you. I need to read it so that I can give you an answer. As you'll be able to talk to Gad, we'll talk tomorrow. Uh, he's a friend of mine. I'll be able to give this answer. Florian is a great fan of ours. Helen to Perry Sosen. Uh, she congratulates on the research and the initiatives of innovation. She thinks Innova Labs for the opportunity of change in terms of mindset. And João Miguel Lima um, uh, says that this project is very, you know, instigating. Uh, instigating. And Celeste Merique, who is a coordinator of the entrepreneurship program, uh, she organized the organizing team to give the total opportunity to present this project and program, highlighting the process of just stacking and its uh, system. And she includes all the vice presidencies as well as a uh, big effort of the success. And she says that is the effort of the activity of this program which aims to amplify the capability of field crews to transform this knowledge into product and solving public health issues. 
many comments congratulating on the NOVA program. I have a Machinese, is August the Sons, who are congratulating. And we also have a Grace from Buenos Aires, who is congratulating Marco Salles from Fiocruz, uh, Ceará. And also many people congratulating on Mariana's presentation about the adaptometers, adaptometers, and Gisela Costa, who is congratulating, Fabio Martins, Ellen Mello, Dr. Tanara Ujujo, she's also congratulating. She's saying that she's really proud of Mariana's work and the evolution of her continuous um, training program as a researcher. Well, and Dr. Tenejo Jorge, she's also posing a question. Do you identify in Rio de Janeiro some initiatives that are similar to those that are described in Minas Gerais State? I believe Rodrigo, could you answer this question? I believe it's in line with what Ana Marcato has presented about the initiative that has been developed in Minas Gerais State, including the OITAC town. Do we have initiatives like this one in the same size of the Minas Gerais ones in Rio Janeiro, or we still need this type of action in Rio Janeiro that is based on innovation? I believe Anna can answer that better than me because Anna is more involved in the public system. Rio Janeiro um, has a critical role for some years in Rio Janeiro, but after that, I don't know what happened later. I don't follow Minas Gerais much. I follow Minas Gerais a lot because I'm, I'm from Minas Gerais. And I'm trying to bring that to Fair Cruz. That's what we're trying to do. That's exactly what we are focusing on. With regards to the innovation system of Biotech Town, for example, I believe Anna has more competence to answer this question. My perception is very similar to Rodrigo's. And in terms of innovation seen at Rio Janeiro, that what I can see, these are very centralized innovation actions that are leveraged by Fiocruz. And I see Fiocruz as a great player that is promoting innovation in the state and with the Innova program. And in the state of Minas Gerais, we can realize that the movement up towards technology, they, they have a different scenario and differentiated. And I believe that because of the context where Minas Gerais and Belarus, which is the capital, is inserted as receiving a research center, I believe that it puts Minas Gerais uh, in a differentiated place in terms of research for our country. This, because we are the main driver, uh, I mean, Nigeria is the main driver in terms of research. And we have had numerous initiatives of innovation by promoting this discussion uh, and dialogue between the greatest projects with the market. And the uh, they, in fact, at the end of the day, they became products. And it has made the city of Minas Gerais to, um, to have this critical role. I'm not saying that is the biggest relevance, but in terms of results, Minas Gerais has um, the biggest ones, the biggest outcomes. Aline, if you allow me, a city of Asina is a part of the investments um has come from us so it's well we are partners already so to, city vaccines is an institution that we have a great admiration and we're really glad to have been able to formalize this partnership it took some time so that it was established established uh because uh these two big institutions that were dialoguing but in at the end of the day we could establish this partnership between an institute that is connected to the university 
and with a private company. So that was a challenge that should be overcome and it will generate lots of fruits. So moving on, we have a question now for Mariana from Grace Bastos. Grace is a biologist, a sanitation biologist from Corumba on the border with Bolivia. And she says, good morning. What is the feasibility for a proteolytic enzyme inhibitor study and specificities for K cells in native plants? I don't know if I understood the question very well. It doesn't really have that much to do with what I said later uh, earlier on about aptamas. Since Grace is on YouTube and I'm here at the IOC, I'd like to understand if she wants to know if there are specific aptamas for these enzymes with applications in vegetable biology. Yes, the answer is yes. They are aptamas are very versatile and can be used on any biomolecule. So if that is the question, the answer is yes. It is possible to adapt to this technology for this kind of enzyme inhibiting its activity and being used in vegetable biology. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. Next, we have a question from Beto Vilela. He asks, how do all these initiatives presented integrate the various players? How do they make this liaison? Is there a matchmaking platform as such? <laughs> Cristiani, would you like to answer? I don't know about the liaison among the many, many initiatives, Innova, Innova Labs, and the entrepreneurship program. Claude, you can also feel free to contribute. Yeah, each one, I think, will have a different viewpoint. We at Innova Labs, we have full integration. We are newer than they are. We didn't take, participate in the program definition. But once it started, we joined them and we are preparing to receive or welcome these people that come out of Innova Labs. As I said, there is a funnel, not everyone is included, but we are preparing ourselves to welcome them and take, take them to the market. We have many interactions through uh, <coughs> Innova. Our entrepreneurship public notice will be made by um, the Innova program. It will be called Innova Emprendedorismo, Innova Entrepreneurship. We also have an idea out of the Innova program. We want to be the final grid. After innovative products, they reach a certain technological maturity. We respect that. And then we perform technological maturity above the innovative products. I don't know if that was my viewpoint is totally relevant for that. No, it's the same as ours. We have worked in line, in tune with this. There are many different areas, but they, they are and they need to be interconnected. It's like, like the slide I showed you earlier. You start off with a small idea, generate that piece of knowledge. The knowledge falls into our radar systems. What I mean is to identify if that has the chance to become a product. And then we submit this to a new product notice, a public notice for a product. And that reaches a, a degree of maturity, ideally, that will enable us if it is very mature, uh, highly mature, then we will enter, it will enter the sequence of what Christiani was, uh, is leading, which is this entrepreneurship notice. So it follows a chain, a, a sequence from the production chain, in the production chain till it reaches the very end. Each one has its own expertise, its own link in the chain. Some are only dedicated to producing knowledge. 
others have a more entrepreneurial spirit. So this varies and we have to take advantage of the potential that we have within field crews with so many people of different profiles, but that are not competitive, but they are complementary, supplementary. So this is a strategic design that is very important that we've been building jointly with many um, vice presidencies and all the different players here that take part in this process. Yes, you, you mentioned a very important point, which is to understand the profile of each um, participant. It's not just because there is a, an entrepreneurship program that everybody has to act as an entrepreneur. If you have the profile of a researcher that will work more towards that line, you'll have another one more focused on research and the other is seeking, is focused more on seeking partners for development or licensing. That is crucial. I think that's the beauty of the, of the thing that we are able to, that we be able to look at this and to know which path we will follow according to each profile. I think that has been a great challenge for us in the many institution areas to bring this in and to support, fully support research according to each one's needs. Very interesting. Now, last question from Marcos Iris, who asks Rodrigo and Cristiani if you could update, create an update about the regulation of the legal framework for field crews, specifically with regard to the publication of the edict about the, deliber uh, the deliberative council has already analyzed this. Now, we're going into the implementation, everything into the legal framework, and if the regiment will proceed. This is ready. It's a very important condition imposed for us to use. This was approved months ago, months ago, maybe even last year. We have the two last questions, the last two questions to conclude this panel. One by Ellen Souza, who asks Rodrigo if you could cl clarify the um, about the, the public notice where will it be made, I should say, for the whole community? Well, as soon as I know, we can put out a communique involving the researchers. Thank you, Rodrigo. Final question from Beto Vilela. He asks, how have institutions been performing in terms of reducing red tape for innovation in the country? Is that for me? That's to everyone. Pure Cruise has worked actively with many groups to try to remove this bureaucratic, these bureaucratic problems. Remember, we are a public institution, so there, we have that little drawback. But once our regiment is, uh, had approval, has approval, I'm sure it will be reduced, but it doesn't happen overnight, I have to add. So it's important that we continue to work together and debating. I'd like to take the opportunity here, Alini, to thank the support by Christiani for the whole process. I think we have to acknowledge both of their work, participation of innovation in Innova Labs and all. This whole immense evaluation follow-up process has been very closely followed and very well run. I'd just like to say thank you for that. Rodrigo, I think uh, 
Theo, Theo Cruz is one institution that has worked very hard to cut red tape. <laughs> Quality, the normative rulings, specific normative rulings for each theme to in order to resolve a few points, make things clearer, greater liaison with the support foundation, with the uh, prosecutor's office. This must, this contact must be increased and it's working very well in Fio Cruz. We have had great uh, connections with the prosecutor's office. And this is very important when a partnership agreement is about to be formalized, a patent license. And the way things are running through the the levels has been has been much swifter. It is a path that we well we build this throughout time. It doesn't happen overnight, as you said. I think we are able we are managing to do that not only at Field Cruise but in other ICTs. Innovation at technological centers. I just to like all the speakers for their presentations, congratulate them, thank them. This, all, all presentations were fantastic, excellent, and it shows the competence of our institution, and we have to be proud of it. We work for this country, for Brazil, and we do it very competently. This has been made more than evident through this table. All presentations were very of a very high level and of very high quality. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. And this was an excellent panel, as expected, due to the quality of the speakers. And thanks very much for the invitation, Alini. Thank you, Jonas, Jonas Pirales. Our director for director for science, innovation, and technology. Thank you for your words. I'd like to thank you all who formed this panel. It was an excellent morning, a very rich discussion. Thank you all for being here, dedicating a bit of your time. We know that everything is uh, just mad, pandemic and everything. It was a great. It was a great event. All those who watched the event on YouTube and sent your questions, I'd like to thank you too. I'd like to take the opportunity here and dedicate this panel to Alini Machado. She is a person that's very dear to us, that uh, we lost to COVID-19. Um, but I'd like to just register here my great affection for her and dedicate this panel to her. Well, we will leave now and then we will come back at 2 p.m. for panel six. Thank you all very much. Bye bye. Excellent. Thank you. Olá, bom dia. Bom dia, Dr. Jonas Perales. Bom dia, Dr. Marcelo Pelagio. Tudo bem? Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Tudo bom dia, bom meninos. Dia, bom dia, como vai? Tudo bem Olá, com você? Olá, Paulo. Olá, Paulo. Muito obrigado pela apresentação. Thank you for the presentations. Thanks for being available as well. Perales, parabéns pela, pela mídia. Congratulations. This great panel, great presentations. Very good. It's all, it's all going good. Yes, well, we have to be ready for two o'clock. 
continuidade às so, apresentações. Moving on with the presentations in our international symposium, we will now, now start panel six. Da manhã. The last panel for this morning in a partnership with Dr. Marcelo Pelagio, I'll be the moderator for this session. And we are going to deal with the perspectives in P and RDI, research, development and innovation. We'll have two presentations. The first one will be given by Dr. Jesu Amaranchi. He is a manager who actually actively participates in the discussion of the legal framework for um, the for science and innovation he conducts many essential projects for the consolidation and he was with us when we built this framework via fortec which is the technology managers forum he is also a coordinator in the center for technological innovation innovation from the university of santa cruz in bahia thank you very much dr jesu so Feel free to make your presentation. I think Jesus had a communication problem. He left the platform. So now we will move on to the second presentation then. Flavio goes first, and when Dr. Jesus is okay, he'll come back. Good morning, once again. Ben, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Flavia Lamaron, biologist, graduated from UERJ, also master's degree from um, UERJ, PhD here from IOC, and he works on, at GSK on the scientific panel. He's going to talk about the, he's going to talk about good practices of G GSK in the, she's going to talk about the opportunities for innovation in public ICTs. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's an honor for me. I'll just uh, try to share my screen here with you. Can you, can you see? Can you hear me, I should say? Yeah, I can't really share my screen. Yeah, go to the green arrow that says share screen. Open it. So once again, it's an honor for me to be here with you. I'm going to illustrate a bit of a few of the PPPs that GSK has formed, public-private partnerships. As previously, uh, as I was introduced, I'm a biologist by a trade. I have worked um, by background. I've worked on, on boards and I've been at GSK for 10 years and we've occupied by the many positions we've occupied, I'm trying to talk about how these positions can now be improved. This is what I've always worked for. I'm going to illustrate examples for you about these um, activities here. I'm, I've, I've worked in many areas in GSK. I'm going to talk about some of them. GSK has been in Brazil for over 110 years, and we've always invested in science and built alliances in Brazil. And one of our main partners for treading the scientific path is Fiocruz. Fiocruz has been with us for a long time. So we work a lot for 
in vaccines and technology transfer. I'd like to show you other possibilities so you can have an open plethora of the things that can, we can do. And you can think about the possibility of bringing new products and how we do this at G GSK together. We have many well, these are study the phase phases of studies, so that you already know. You know this is basic science preclinic phase one, one where three, products where are products analyzed are to reach so that they can be to reach patients, patients in order to be used by them. Phase four, phase four, this product is already, product is already commercialized, and there are some demands by the FDA that still, still need, need to be analyzed, be analyzed. in terms of the safety, efficacy, and whenever a product is marketed to population, is exactly when we understand the real. Um, result of this product and all these phases that we will carry out since the basic science clinical preclinical phase and two phase four we have collaborations um, across brazil and i'm going to show you how we do that there are different work fronts in these clinical the trials in phase one two three four in the preclinical phase and observational trials as well is usually and they don't need any phase of products because we can perform observational studies um, when we understand the disease that doesn't have the use of any products. And also the initiative of the investigators, GSK works like a funding uh, source of investment, but it does not participate in the study design, not even the outcomes of the studies. So it belongs to the investigators and exclusive to the institution that proposed the initial idea. In phase three, um, in phase three, we have seen uh, the growing number of advances, and currently, GSK is working with many biotechnological molecules. Then I can say that these molecules are agnostic, but in fact, it doesn't have a single mechanism. Um, or not even a single possibility of studies in diseases. So in terms of immunotech oncology, these are molecules that are translational to different therapeutic areas. Then there is a great chance of translation uh, and reposition of products with these new molecules that have been developed biotechnologically. It has been developed for specifically for lupus, and then we could reposition a product for immunotherapy to lupus and even for COVID, for lung fibrosis that we could direct to COVID. One of the examples that I'd like to bring to you so that you can get to know, which is Trust in Science. It's a project. It's a global uh, financial bridge for acceleration of studies and development of research in Latin America. Many countries have already been contemplated, including Brazil, has been included by Trust in Science. And it makes, it provides acceleration. So you can grow institutionally. For example, after submitting institutional projects in Trust in Science, you can do that. Or you can establish individual partnerships. Maybe one lab has, uh, a pharmaceutical industry has a product that wants to speed up the uh, of a, uh, speed up a molecule that is interesting for the business. And we have this global initiative front, which is Trust Science. We have FAPESH, NPQ, Fiocruz, Fiocruz um, Foundation. And we intend to increase it, to increase this way of working in LATAM. I believe that within the products that we have, the projects that we have carried out, over 14 projects, we have more than 75 partners in which uh, we have these partnerships. But we have had, in fact, 90 articles that were published, and we have different, different fields in medicine, oncology, HIV, therapy, so many different types of specialties that can be contemplated by this initiative. These are some examples of this initiative because it's a model 
especially because it respects um, hierarch the hierarchy of our institution and it observes if there is a, if there is a patent and it checks if the patent belongs to the institution uh, and GSK uh, won't uh, detain the patent because it respects the relationship with uh, the institution that has initial uh, proposition. And we have a theme-based uh, layers that has been established with Butantan Institute or FAPES, Peace and PQ. And we also support startups uh, of biominas that are supported by this type of program. Just, it's just to let you know that it's a very diverse in, in initiative to accelerate products. And also, um, whole institutions like Butantan is contemplated, and some other partners, uh, Bastia from Uruguay, that's another contemplated institution in this initiative, I mean, trust in science. And you we can also observe uh, the, the ways of collaboration that are based on some models, international models to cover these needs. We also have other layers that are global, that are part of Global Health Pharma Unit, which have specific interests, for example, malaria. And we have the links of supervision. Over there, you see the calls, you see the template, for example, for malaria, and it's totally open to new demands and to technologies or any type of innovation that is important for a specific disease that will bring hope to patients. When you see a link and you see a call to malaria only, please don't, don't lose your hope because uh, we can have new projects in there to illustrate to have brought some quick response to, to COVID through the interaction with biotechnology agencies. And in cooperation of these products is being done in along with biotechnology agencies. So please don't feel disappointed when there is a call to malaria only, but try to talk about these proposals, please be hopeful. We know that these partnerships are very important because there are many brilliant scientists out of our company and the great ideas are all welcome. It doesn't have a nationality, it doesn't need to have institutional um, barriers. So we just need to understand what the proposal is so that we can work in a collaborative way. And we know as an institution that these good ideas bring innovation to all of us. This is quite important to our business then. Well, our core business in Brazil, especially, are the clinical trial phases where we can collaborate with many hospitals and many state-owned institutions that help us out to carry out the clinical research. And you can imagine the Brazil population is critical to this scene. When we bring a clinical trial of a molecule, be it from Brazil or other place, we identify the hospitals and science institutions that are able to carry out this research. And I cannot say that it's a private database, but any type of person that is interested in participating in the research of GSK, you can um, apply for it to be um, a researcher in this project. But of course, you have to follow the gold standard premises so that you can continue and carry out the uh, research according to the standards and norms that GSK requests requires. And we also have key uh, partners in Brazil. These figures was gotten from a clinical trial just so to see the impact of the clinical trials in Brazil. 
I couldn't update this database of the clinical trial because of this pandemic, and then the base is very instable, and then we could not update to uh, 2019, 2020, 2021 because of this COVID-19 pandemic. Our clinical trials are dynamic of the many studies that are coming. <coughs> this is just for you to see the impact we have got in Brazil. So each phase, one, two, three, four, and observation that are colored, as you can see on the screen. And, and we already know that for 2019, 2020, 2021, we have changed the profile because many phase one and two studies have been included. And also because of the acceleration for medications to treat the COVID-19. On top of that, we repositioned some products. Then we know that this graph currently has already been changed. In order to show the randomized clinical trials in 2019, 2021, we have brought some figures for you. We have 23 clinical trials with 11 ones that are planned and we packed over 150 research centers in the University of Brazil, over 150 investigators from Brazil are involved, over 1,300 subjects and patients are recruited and over 1,600 patients are planned. So we can imagine it brings a great benefit in terms of research and treatment and even planning as well for the approval of a vaccine because of the study that was carried out here. And then we can have the recognition of the researchers and we know how the experience war and what they think about the strategy and how they understand that it should be conducted, even though that molecule is not successful because some of these molecules are not approved. And, but they need to understand what happened in the study so that we can reposition and redesign the studies or even um, give up on some molecules. So these pieces of information are very important to us. Here we have another word front, which are studies that are supported by GSK that can be collaborative or they belong to the investigator. And there are some specific calls dif uh, from different areas and interests. <clears throat> and there is a website specific to that, and people can submit their proposal of a trial. And we have the investigational and observational ones, that, which are the most frequent one trials in Brazil. And we have asthma, uh, lupus, vaccines, HIV, oncology, and now COVID will be also uh, included in observational studies. And 50 studies were submitted so far. Uh, we haven't had so many studies. But I, I, we are really glad, for example, in lupus, that we didn't have any study, but now we have five trials focusing on lupus that are Brazilian. So it's a, a reason of joy. And we have 16 studies that are approved. Uh, two in respiratory disease, five in lupus, and nine in uh, HIV. Planned patients over 7,100, uh, including patients over 1,300, and we have 21, 28 study centers in Brazil. And these uh, trials that are belong to the investigator, they can um, cover any kind of phase here. I have already seen, for example, basic size and preclinical trials that were included for the position of a molecule in Brazil is usually located in phases three and phases four. These are the phases that have the sponsored studies, uh, studies um, and then what we call ISS and their vaccine, immunotherapy, respiratory disease, oncology, HIV, global health as well can be included and you can submit your proposals. And some of them have specific calls, for example, lupus, vaccines, but global health is a little, little bit more open to some areas. And then I try to bring studies that would challenge the system, be uh, in innovation. Now, are you 
pinpoint some studies over here so that you can understand this type of mission. I bring you here these examples because the investigative studies not necessarily use products by JSK, but you can treat the knowledge of a disease in a better way, for example. For example, for associated factors uh, to a cumulative de uh, damage to patients with lupus, I mean, systemic uh, erythroma Eritomatous lupus is one of the studies. We also have studies that treat the biomarkers that are simulated in circulating lymph lymphocyte B that are associated with neuropsychiatric manifestations. Our market doesn't use any type of medication. And this study is beautiful. I can bring an example because it comes from uh, the State University of Rio de Janeiro. It works with biomarkers and it analyzes the reasons of levels of lymphocytes stimulants. And there are some biomarkers for preeclampsis to analyze a scene of a pregnant woman that has got lupus to see if it's a real, really preeclampsis or, or if it is an exacerbation of the disease of the patient. So it's a beautiful study. So these are small examples so that you can see. So you don't need to use the product for being included in this type of initiative. As a protagonist in HIV, you have a Russell, uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, Ferro Cruz, with the study uh, of the prevalence and risk factors associated to uh, hepatic uh, metabolic diseases and also cardiovascular diseases in transgender, transgender women infected uh, in, in HIV. This is another example of a collaborative studies. And this is another entity. It's not an investigative studies anymore. And in fact, GSK has a strategic interest and the external research also had a strategic interest and we started to gather the interest and we designed a study together. So the other project is Makuna Ima project and it looks at the perspective of the patient. What is the systemic factor, um, uh, impacts of lupus? For example, a person that has stopped, wor stopped working or because of absenteeism, they couldn't perform all the functions of this person. And how can we measure such a thing? It was important because you don't have this data of the population available. Uh, they don't even have the data related to costs and even the perspective of the patient, it's uh, himself or herself. You have to see the impact on the patient's life style. As a product, we're going to have publications that you treat um, the, the cost, the perspective of the patients. We're going to have the mapping of lupus patients in Brazil and how they can travel to be um, served in healthcare system. For example, there are some, for example, there are some states in Brazil that take a long time, like in Manaus, for them to reach the healthcare unit. Another point that I would like to highlight and bring your attention to in this presentation is that we have all the innovation assets pipeline and it's uh, made available in a public link and everybody can access to it. And we see the, all the molecules that are being worked on and which phase is it, is they are in. And you see that the research institutions can see to see if we, they can make a matching. They can say that they liked this HIV uh, molecule that is in phase two, then I would like to use that for a different strategy that is being used here. So I would, uh, be included in a collaborative study, for example, and they would challenge you and how these molecules, they are biotechnological or agnostic, and we really work with biotech, they are monoclonal or they are molecules that are able to block in some kind of mechanism that can be used uh, in a translational fashion because they treat uh, 
um, mechanisms, action mechanisms, and then we have this matching. But we have a challenge because these pipelines of all these companies are available and it can become a very important database so that you can understand which pharmaceutical industries and laboratories are participating and what molecules would be interesting to your institution, for example. We also have open labs. We work with a lab in first campus in Spain and some of the researchers of Field Cruise have already worked with this institution. And it's a lab that um, makes main, many training courses and materials available and form many resources. And it's exactly for developing countries and for the call of emergency diseases. Então, ele também acelera, ele cobre esse gap justamente da pesquisa básica ao desenvolvimento do produto final. Mas uma das coisas que eu gostaria de It covers this gap. The researcher they pay for the training courses, and this open lab um, can work a molecule that is being treated. So I believe that these are the greatest examples that we have got, the partnerships that we have already uh, performed with many institutions, uh, with um, fomenting agencies, uh, FM, IMF, Linda Gates, Harvard, Cambridge, um, the University of Sao Paulo. And we also work with the Tata Institute. So don't feel inhibited to approach us because our partnership are, have been performed for so long and Field Cruise is one of the protagonists of these partnerships, especially in vaccines. Now with CSS studies, but I, really I hope, hope we are we able can, to narrow, um, have bring together these different possibilities. possibilities, which may happen in order to build paths in Brazil. So thank you very much. That is what I had to say. I thank you again for the invitation. Great presentation, Flavia. We'll leave the comments, the Q&A to the end, as we've been doing on every panel. So in sequence now, I would like to ask Carlos Eduardo to introduce Dr. Jesus. Congratulations on your excellent presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Jesus Amir Amaranchi, Science, Technology, and Innovation Manager, and has participated a lot in CTI legal frameworks in Brazil. Take part, he has taken part in other collegiates at the beginning of the discussions, a legal framework. He was at Fiocruz in 2016 17, as soon as the innovation law was changed in 2016. It's great to see you again. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much for being available once again. So feel free to carry out your presentation. I'd like to thank the uh, field crews for the invitation. It's always great to visit you. Unfortunately, not exactly to, I couldn't visit you physically. I, I've been, I was there before 2016, mind you. I'm going to show you a picture proving this. So thank you very much for the invitation to this discussion. I've been following your great discussions. This kind of um, way you've been working here has shown that the legal framework has caught on. We just need to delve deeper and I'd like to talk about that. talk about the challenges. My presentations, uh, ah, here's the slide. There's always one that pops up. I'd like to talk to you a bit about why we worked on this uh, legal framework process. We need, um, we need a conditional ITC system in Brazil. We need to develop, of course, infrastructure. It's all, it all looks very obvious, but it's worth repeating. 
personnel, the people need to be trained, motivated, kept up to date. Funding, everyone knows about these three pillars, right? But frequently people say that you need rules or norms that combine with all these pillars. This is a necessary set for us to have predictability and compatibility among the many actions and programs, which leads to problems, delays, etc. So cooperation and competition involves these two issues as well as business. They always involve cooperation and competition with the same people. When you are cooperating, you never want to be the slower coach and in competition, you want to always be at the front of everything. And that is necessary. All these instruments are equally necessary. Of course, depending on the kind of action, you will be one or one or the other may be less critical. But if you don't have this full set of elements present, you will not even be able to plan your actions. And if you're not capable of planning, it may well go wrong. Science, technology and innovation is a set of, uh, brings together a set of things that were never done before. Other important things depend on infrastructure, people, resources and legislation. <clears throat> and also what we want to uniquely do is something never done before. In other words, these activities are intrinsically unpredictable. You can do everything very correctly and accurately and it still go wrong. The so-called technological risk, sometimes you can't explain. It's difficult to explain to everyone. It's difficult to, to carry, you know, to follow an exact recipe. When you build a bridge, there may be um, unpredictabilities, but there are techniques. We need to work with what is not totally dominated and tread where no one has ever been. It involves some of that. So that is the problem. <clears throat> and legislation is important. Way back when, 11 years ago, at the fourth Science Technology Conference, we spoke a lot about this because we were going through a relatively um, surplus period there were resources available and the great problem we have now is that we were not able to spend all that and so uh, dra uh, the bill 2177 came out it's always good to go back a bit to know how we reached the follow follow and to see how we arrived here i was here right this it was in 2011 2013 excuse me at Fiocruz, where we were discussing as part of the design we were carrying out to assemble and set up what we call the science, technology and innovation legal framework. We used to call it the science and technology um, pillar. This is, we, this happened in almost all states. <clears throat> On the right, in the hundreds of meetings we had in Brasilia, sometimes we spent the whole day discussing two or three articles, but it's important because we really we needed, there was great effort to map out the problems for each segment. There's no way that I, my, my, I, as a physicist working in Bahia, to know about Fiocruz problems, there's no way people from USP know the problems the Navy has, etc. And this is a very rich process, and uh, Fiocruz had intense participation. One of the great, the most, one of the strongest participants in these meetings, and. I got to know a lot about Fiocruz in spite of not being here physically, but I heard about all the reports and the problems. 
I call this jokingly when people, yeah, problem-based learning in education, we call it. We carried out problem-based legislating. We mapped out all the problems and we set up a process of <clears throat> of doing away with the problems. So we had law 13.243 after project 85 in 2015, we had the decree and now we are in the innovation pol policies. Now we land on a framework that is closer to our institutions, closer to where we are. This is a list, it's a wish list, I think you could say, of homework that we set up at the working group of the, for the legal framework. These were items that we listed as goals to be achieved. Some of them have changed. We were going to propose a differentiated regime for public hiring. This ended up being in, involved inside the, the law that was eventually enacted. And something that I mentioned to Fio Cruz as well is that we law we worked very hard to to unlock the law of biodiversity access. We ended up have participating in that as well somehow. And the next steps after the law thirteen two forty three and our regulation, or importantly after that was the law. Um, incentivizing innovation in small companies and small and medium companies. People talk about legal startup frameworks. I have a few concerns regarding how things came out, but it's moving on. We're still within the legal framework process, but we're getting there. One very important part here that I'd like to highlight and Fiocruz has a very important role here, which is the <clears throat> Science, Technology and Innovation System uh, National Law, which was the Constitutional Amendment number 85. This process was interrupted, which is very bad because in our working groups, we were counting on this for the next stage. We touched the norms part. The framework was created during a bonanza, peri bonanza period. We want to deal more efficiently, effectively with the resources we had then. Reorganizing the concession distribution and evaluation mechanisms of the resources would come later after the system was rediscussed. And this just halted, it was not touched on. So many important points that were touched on on the framework. I didn't make the whole list, just important points. We, in the law, we, we put, we see things that are happening in field crews due to the vaccine situation. We wanted to actualize what we wanted and the particular feature of the framework is important. Not everything in it was created in the process. In law 10973 in 2004, this was, was already determined, but we, we needed to carry out repair and adjustment in order to see what could be done. And it worked. That's very important to mention. There are many things that are already being performed in many other institutions. And something that not everyone has realized is that many municipalities after the framework, they created their own legislations, including the science and technology and elevation. So there are many municipalities, not all states have updated their legislation, but there are many processes that started, especially from 2016, to update the state laws. Very interesting institutions took part. Some uh, states are more, in, more ahead than others. Still, some are still in the middle. This is a, a table we compiled showing 
the status, the update status for each state. Rio de Janeiro state, unfortunately, is lagging behind. They were one of the first put out an interesting <clears throat> topic, but then they just stopped. Then the update of the framework in institutions were, uh, we carried out this work with the Ministry of Science and Technology, where we created a, a guideline, the institutions where people could verify what was made in the discussion process. Field queries one was one we used to show what had already been done. And it was very interesting to show what people had done and how others could follow up. Now, let's move forward. Let's look to the future, so to speak. Reaching the topic of challenges and opportunities, it's very important that we think about Brazil. Brazil in the future cannot be Brazil of 100 years ago, an agrarian and commodity-based economy. This economic complexity depends of advancing technologically. The framework is important for this because it enables our, our institutions to take part. We have some important challenges. I hope I'm still within my time. I, we still have a few uh, hindrances, some problems at some levels. An important case at the federal level is um, replanning. Not as much as things have been done, but not as much as could be. Another important issue here, as soon as law 13243 was approved, we had the four, uh, the 10 sub clauses, so to speak. We ended up not being able to work with most of them, but there was a bill in the Senate to adjust the process and start off what had been erroneously vetted in order to make some readjustments <coughs> to our legislation. It's like to a second layer of paint over law 12243. This has been stationary. It's in the Commission and Justice Council and is stationary there. We have already identified problems and things can be improved there's been a loss of focus in the last few years. The focus was on strengthening the national system of science, technology, and innovation, STI. And we started moving in, a, in the wrong direction, in my opinion. And <clears throat> efforts were, were honed into something which was not correct, the correct one. We needed to discuss with people how institutions, what stand they will take within this process. That was a bad point in time. And in most cases, um, the abandonment of law, the law of science, technology and innovation stopped off. Midway, this other hindrance appeared, which is the former um, expenses cap. There's a famous quotation that I'd like to repeat, but I can't remember. Oh, for every very complex problem, there is a simple solution, which is wrong. So the expense cap was that, a simple solution for complex problems. Nowadays, we are going through these problems, these additional problems, for seeking solutions that no other country has been able to attain. At some time, this will have to be removed, this cap, and this will have to be solved. And people have to say, look, this can't be solved, right? Instead of consolidating and improving the instruments, we still have threats of extinction. The, somebody before before me now just said <clears throat> these instruments are under threat due to the constitutional amendment recently put out about for the um legal uh, for the financial aid and there were death threats to the um it law so while we are discussing improvements of the instruments we have been betrayed 
and there is <clears throat> a great strength of being destructured. Now, a more positive stance here, the pandemic, which is a negative thing, has shown that we need to, we need to take advantage of moments, right? Sometimes they bring positive things. One of the things that I think we could call a good legacy, so to speak, of this pandemic is that it brought out into the open our technological dependence, especially in the health sector. Depen technological dependence is a bad idea. The philosophy of let's buy it cheaper one day and then we import over 90% of health inputs. This doesn't work. And we can see that this process is happening that ranges from vaccines to equipment, basic equipment, gloves, for example, masks. We are not self-sufficient to be able to hand out N95 masks for the health system. And it's not to everybody. I'm talking about the doctors here. We are not able to provide masks, not even to our health system, in enough quantity. You can't, that's something that doesn't, you can't even think of. Oh, now we more and more invest in the intensive care unit. And we see this acceleration that more and more we have the idea that the government can leave the place where the market is going to have this play this role but it's unreal because it's been um more accurate it has never been so clear that we should abandon this bad idea because one thing leads to another and then it would uh strengthen the single health system of brazil And when we had the institutional amendment to 85, uh, our aspiration was a single health system of Brazil. We would like to have the single health system to science with integrated policies. And, well, as the single health system has a critical role in this process, in this process it will help us out to show how on how to do that. And we should have a, a good opportunity as a model of the construction of the legal framework. And here we have to see on how to build it, to make it a uh, coordinated construction, to have everybody um, with uh, your rules. That's a model that works and it should be applied to other things as well. I have got some uh, other slides, uh, additional slides, and I bring some important things. It's important to refresh our memories on some points. First, a public researcher is not only the professor in the university, the concept is much wider, much broader. And it's important to remember the Article 14a that the public research um, is not only, but in, but it's also those that um, can have some remunerated activities as well, uh, besides the position that they have as a public researcher. Then it's very clear when you see these two fragments of our law, and then it helps us out. It's not only about the professors in the university that have access to this permission, this allowance. It depends on the process of approval and the manifestation of agreement of the ITCs that has already been created in the innovation policy. Here we have a, a challenge and opportunity, which is basic. I, I say something here that it has been in the law since 2004, which is the Article 26 that talks that the ITCs that contemplate their teaching among the main activities should associate mandatorily the application of the disposed, what is disposed in the law. 
And here I'm talking about training. I mean, a biology student or an engineering student that would uh, finish the college degree but doesn't know what a patent is and they don't know how the software license takes place. It's not something bad, but it's also illegal. <coughs> then we should observe this point because it should take a deep dive in this aspect, in the uh, legal framework. And for such thing, we need the youth, our young researchers should know about these points. And part of this effort is a program that is called FORTEC. I mean, it's Profnit, uh, which is managed by FORTEC, which is a master's course on intellectual property. And we have 32 focal points in 22 different states of Brazil. And we have 945 active enrolled students in a professional a master's course. But of course, it's better to start that before and then even before the college course. I'd like to thank you all uh, for the opportunity. I hope I have contributed to this discussion and so that we can give more autonomy and training for our country in this, in this respect. Thank you, Dr. Jesil Amarante. I thank you for that image as well. It was in 2015 in the Ainge uh, School uh, Salon. Thank you very much, Flavia, for your presentation. I have two questions that come from the audience, and one for Flavia, and the other one to uh, Egesio. Flavia, in your presentation, you shared Open Lab. Uh, that experience in Spain, where the Oswaldo Cruz Institute has been discussing international cooperation and their disruptive cooperation with International Platform for Science, Technology, and Innovation, uh, which has an innovation hub characteristics, which is located in the Technological Park in Europe, specifically in Portugal, in partnership with the University of Aveiro. And the Institute already has got a physical space within this technological park. And that's a very uh, multi-facet uh, um, partnership with over 60 organizations from Europe and also Brazil. And then I would like to ask you if this type of initiative could also receive uh, foment or we could have some kind of foment because it's a multilateral initiative, multidisciplinary initiative as well. And we have a very strong front of global health, as you shared in your presentation. And can I make the question to pose the question to Jesus already? Yes. Okay. In line with international um, um, acting of ITCs, we have a chapter that talks about the international participation of ITCs. So, in your vision, uh, what have you observed? Uh, in terms of effective application of these um, of the participation of universities in the Brazilian IC, ITCs. So if you can share a little bit about that, I would appreciate very much. Thank you, Dr. Jesu. Well, trying to answer this question, I don't have a, a real answer, but each submission is treated differently and treated by the different work fronts. In fact, I don't know all of them and how it's done or the criteria for global health. I only know the website and the initiatives, but I don't know what the criteria and how uh, the, the formation of Open Lab was held. It's, it does not belong to GSK, but it's only funded by GSK. So I really don't know much about it. So, so we cannot translate one into another. Thank you, Flavio. Mr. Gisil. Okay. With regards to the international action, I remember that this was a very strong demand of fuel crews because of the need of facilitating the work of cooperation 
and the work that your Cruz performs in other countries as well. And we have, uh, in fact, I wouldn't have a very clear vision on how the, the framework can, could be implemented with regard to this specific measure. And I will tell you why. During this same period, we are experiencing a moment when our academia was, uh, we needed to be internationalized, but I'm talking about the traditional internalization operation, exchange of people, uh, and then science without frontiers program. And so far, we could facilitate this process, but afterwards, after the approval of this framework, we see a decline in terms of resources for this type of collaboration. And in fact, I would give this, uh, uh, this question back because one of the problems that were identified were about the um, research, the researchers, uh, safety and security of this um, researcher. Uh, that is working on behalf of the Brazilian institutions overseas. Of course, this is specific to some specific, to some determined institutions, for example, in Brapa, that have got uh, units that are active overseas. And I haven't followed how it was uh, taking place after the approval of the legal framework. And I'm kind of curious because this was a very important issue and really struggled so that this article should be included in the act. Thank you, Brazil. I'm going to share all the details of this proposal. Can you send it by email? We can share and exchange information for sure, okay? So I can say that is done by official um, official mission. And the period of license is connected to the period of the project. Marcelo, I would you like to conduct any questions? I'd like to thank once again, um, Dr. Flavio, Jesil, and thank you for your participation. But I have some questions to each of you. I'm going to tr I'm going to summarize that. Flavia, I'm going to do one and then another. Flavio, yesterday we had a panel in the afternoon with some colleagues from uh, international uh, innovation agencies where we could have could have a dialogue in terms of making up approaches. How was it seen within GSK? Because you showed two important initiatives, big uh, initiatives, trust and science, that can be individual based or institutional decision based. But on top of the active uh, search of people, and then they would go to the site and see the opportunities. How do you see an, uh, the opposite um, approach? How does JSK map these innovation uh, scene? What is the site? Um, that goes beyond the format in innovation and research because there is an idea of assembling a network of, of foment of uh, foment for research and innovation. Now, I would like to see the other side, information, initiatives. So what can you say about it? Thank you for your question, it's excellent. And in fact, the, the work that we develop is to make this type of interaction, and especially when the product is already submitted or, or is in the pipeline so that we can identify the, the potential places so that we can perform the research. And we also work in a multidisciplinary fashion. 
you know, have a clinical um, trials of the ISS team, and we actively seek and there is a map uh, and of those who have participated in clinical trials and we have international map of these people that are trying to actively seek. For example, we have a new era, COVID. I don't know any of the doctors, but I had to make a, a search to see what the doctors were that were already participating in previous studies and that they had a potential of delivery in this, in this regard. But it doesn't mean that uh, as I was visiting other doctors, and, and then we could identify new partners as well. It's open, of course. And so if people comply with pre-requirements of studies and the number of patients, it's okay. So it's all, it's all right for us. And we actively seek this type of people. All our medical panel uh, works uh, with a group of researchers and doctors, and we already know that there are people who are potential uh, members, potential candidates to perform this type of research. But on the other hand, in order not to make not, not to make the system addicted uh, to this kind of procedures, we try to have an active uh, search, and it kind of facilitates uh, our our process. For example, there is Fukuz, and I have to see what are the researchers that belong to Fukuz that are participating in our study. So, in this way, we will see. What are those that participate, for example, in a work front of HIV or a submission of research? And it's easy to find these people. If in the institutional page, it was already identified what the person, the people are, uh, what the resources they have. And it would help us a lot to try to do such a thing in, a, uh, in an in-house fashion. Um, and we, sometimes we, we, we make a search in Google, sometimes we make a phone call, and we kind of assemble a network for the people that you already know until you reach those that you really need. It's kind of difficult this way. Well, the event, we have had a presentation about that. And we have the specific institutions within IOC, which is the technological um, uh, institutions for COVID. And besides these uh, projects and products, and there should also be a showcase for institutional aspects. I believe, yes, of course, I believe it would make, a, make things easier. Not only our life, but Charlie said to want to find you. Uh, even networks that want to find you. Interinstitutional networks uh, would um, help us a lot. I have another question to Gesil. Yeah, you can bring the question. We can move on. I'd like to make a comment. This competence mapping, Flavia, is very important. We have been pinpointing that. And there are some Brazilian institutions that have got ready systems for such thing. And here in our university, we kind of assembled a system. And UFMG University created another one. And these are mechanisms that make things easier. And there are some other things that are being assembled and have been building that. And they have created some competence mapping tools, but we still need to have something which is a benchmark for the whole nation for this type of work. For those who have a lax platform, you need to have a, a lax is the first step. You know the person and you know we have to look this person. But if I don't know who Jesus is, I need to know further information, uh, about you, I don't know how to map these competences. And this is the next step. And some things have been already assembled, but we still need to have a, a reference instrument. And I'm here available to talk about that. Congratulations, congratulations. 
assim, para todos nós, na verdade, que precisamos procurar vocês, a gente tem que... For all of us that need to talk to you, we need to use AI, we have to use Google. Um, and you have to see what is done, what you do, what kind of... Uh, what are contact details as well? I believe this is very important, but sometimes it's difficult to have such a thing. Well, it's possible to do such a thing as you are mentioning, but it needs to be a policy uh, that should be created to create this type of competence mapping system. And also in terms of infrastructure, because if I want to use a piece of equipment and the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation has has created a structure in the website and which is a platform in the ministry that brings this approach, which is to map the infrastructure. We have some institutions uh, over here with this idea. It's important to know if an institution wants to cooperate with us. With us, we need to map up. Yes, the competences. Thank you. Based on still following on to that question, this is a national platform for infrastructure and research. Recently, due to a FINEP demand, some Fiocruz platforms are already registered. Alini Moraes was saying earlier in the chat, in this logic of competency mapping, we've been talking about this in the Institute, this project was, uh, a project is to be approved in new, under new management to know who, uh, this should be concluded by April next year. It will be an important point regarding this contact that we've been talking about. Jesus, with regard to what you said, I liked your um, speech. You made a few very interesting quotes that I've underlined here, and they're very important because we see a tool. Uh, the legal framework is as important as it is. I have this feeling that it's not fully ready. And as this is a complex problem, it demands a complex solution. So your quotation by Wayne Mikkel, I think, about a, su a simple, elegant solution that is wrong. Something like this then takes a lot of time, needs a lot of brainstorming. And I also liked your illusion. I'd never thought of it through that viewpoint. When you talked about uh, in inputs for science, where we can create a multi-level structure, use a few um, items that can be used. Still along this line, Dr. Daniela mentioned when she said we have a lot, a long path still to tread. So what I would like to ask you is, in the mid midst of a pandemic such as this, where on one hand, so many, you were questioned so much, and on the other, the other hand, we were providing ice. Vaccines happened because of science and cooperation was also an important part. So how can a scenario like this help us to open up agendas in the legislative branch, for example, science and technology agenda, as you mentioned, I didn't really understand uh, exactly, but how can we advance in terms of the framework? Although it will be a hard task, although this pandemic was very negative, can it have um, a positive outcome in terms of science and politics to help people to understand, underline the investment necessary for us to move forward and to avoid, as you said, to advance progressively as um, a, a commodity economy. Yeah, thank you for your question. I just want to separate the two question in two. 
the framework is a process that is always evolving. When we started off, we used to call it the National Code for Science and Technology. We abandoned this, the word code. We learn right as we go on with the lawyers. A code is usually more stable and remains longer as it is. It's supposed to be perennial. And we knew that our construction wanted to afford the idea of a code because it was uh, comprehensive, but not static. One thing is stability. The other is to be static. We knew it would be a living organism. And as much as it had been built with so much debate, little problems will always come up. We knew, the, sometimes we knew the right thing to do, but we had difficulties to convince both politicians as well as the government structure. So bit by bit, the system needs to be perfected. How do we take advantage of the moment? Even before the pandemic, science was already being attacked and beaten. We could have used this period soon after the decree in order to strengthen or consolidate this brick, which is part of the construction of making a more modern economy Brazil in terms of making business knowledge more agile. This is all part of this process of strengthening our people strengthening our country, using our capabilities better. This brick should have been, instead of that, we went the other way. We went through a, a period of questioning science as a value, not just as a tool, but as a value also as a tool. And as we became you know, a house where the bread, we are lacking bread, everyone fights and nothing happens. We needed a fight to justify cuts, right? People to say science is a priority. You know, science is a priority to suffer cuts. That's what happened at one point. So we need money for this, we need funds for this. Where are we gonna take it from? Science, I'm talking about science in general, innovation, technology. This marks the sector that needs to be reinforced. I think it's a, a challenge for us. We are within this macro sector. And then I talk, when I say macro sector, it's education, science and technology, companies, also the people that uh, say, my business won't run in a backward country. The framework process was somewhere where we came very close together academia, the industry, generally speaking, right? Industry, proper agriculture. Many important players took part in this process of coming closer. We need to go deeper into that and go back to what we were doing during the framework. Join forces and propose a new review of the finance instruments. And frequently people ask me, the framework was uh, was based or inspired by what model? US, France? None. We mapped out the problems and we just dealt with them. The problem based, based legislating, as I said before. Similarly, we don't need to copy the solutions from anyone else. We have important subsystems in Brazil that have been tested that we can use to copy things that gave great results, that really worked. The people from the Ministry of Economy like to um, touch on this a lot. The best system we currently, the best subsystem we have for science, technology and innovation in Brazil is the one from the state of Sao Paulo. I, I'm from Bahia, I lived in Rio, so I can praise people from Sao Paulo without being accused of any bias. Why? You, look, you can see the results. 
why did we have these results? You can see results, for example, Unicamp University has like a, a set of uh, the children of Unicamp. Let's just talk about numbers. The revenue taken in by these children of Unicamp was 8 billion reais. That's four times the budget, the, the Unicamp budget at that time. So to invest in science, technology and innovation, STI, pays off, it gives profit. You don't need an economist to say that whatever gives profit, you don't make cuts to because you'll be cutting your revenue. It's really shooting yourself in the foot. So that's just an example. And why does the system in Sao Paulo work like this? There is a joke that the British say. They say, they say why, do, why is the grass in England in the lawn so well taken care of? Well, very simple. Water in the summer and, su and reap in the winter. Do that continuously for 200 years. Sao Paulo, this may be a rude word for many people. They have revenue bonding since the 1960s. 1% of FAPESP is theirs. Nobody can touch it. Many governors tried, but society itself there understands the economy there. Sao Paulo is rich because they invested in FAPESP continuously. So stability in fermentation and technical stability. The SABESP president is not nominated by the governor willy-nilly. There has to be a deliberation of a council. So management is shared with society. In some states, others, other than Sao Paulo, we see that that happens. You don't need to be a very rich state. In the state of Ceará, 2% of taxable income um, is paid out. This has been happening for less time, but they're going in the right direction. I found out last week that the Ceará State University has already requested and visa authorization for a vaccine that they are proposing. All the results Ceará State has in science, technology and education come from that. It's been 20 years where they are have already done things that have worked. So we can use experiences in Brazil that worked out, that give you profit and copy ourselves in Brazil in what works to devise a sustainable national system. Sustainable, I mean, that can lead Brazil to become really an independent country. Next year, we'll be celebrating 500 years of since, sorry, a hundred years since independence. But what are we celebrating? Maybe the fact that we can, we have woken up a bit and trying to strive for autonomy. We can do this copying ourselves. Of course, we can always um, learn from others' mistakes. What we cannot do is to continue shooting ourselves in the foot and doing what we know won't work. Thank you, Gisele. We have more questions, but due to time restraints and this afternoon's panel, we can't really uh, continue now, but there's an interesting question here that we will forward by email, Jesu, if you allow me, the, about the um, Center for Technological Innovation Sentences Personality. Thank you all very much. So I'll see you in the next panel a bit later. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye.